So we are rolling. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The Creative Businessman. Today we have the very talented actor, Drew Matthews, with us in the studio. Uh, Drew, you want to say hello to everyone? And hey everybody, how's it going? I'm a talented actor. <laughs> you are. <laughs> I've done a lot of local commercials that uh, play on the public access. So, oh, come on. You know. <laughs> and then some other stuff. Yeah, yeah. plus yeah. over 50 really good credits on IMDb. Maybe that. Yeah. But those local commercials, hey, pretty legit. Yeah. Hometown hero. That's right. <laughs> I got patted down at the airport. Ah. They recognized me in a local commercial. I was like, oh. you don't recognize me on, from NBC? And like, <laughs> but you're the dumb guy. You're the dumb husband in that uh, local Heating and air conditioning. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that is fair. That is fair. Uh, that's no funny. residuals for that, though, unfortunately. No. <laughs> hey, I'm glad that's, to be here, guys. That's a one yeah, and done. Glad you're here. <laughs> Happy to have you. Yeah. All right. So I guess uh, when <clears throat> when did you get into acting, or what got you into acting? Uh, my mother forced me, oh. like a dictator, oh. to get into it. Because she was a really good musical theater actress. Okay. And. Um, uh, for many years a single mom so uh, uh my parents split up when i was like six months old they eventually got back together years later that was weird <laughs> <laughs> just having some man <laughs> like come into the house and tell you what to do all of a sudden um and with authority too um but uh so she would take my older sister and i to all of her uh rehearsals or or, or musical rehearsals or anything like that. We were always having to watch musicals, things like that. So I got kind of into it that way. And um, yeah, man, I loved, I loved uh, the classics like Danny Kaye, uh, The Court Jester. That was one of my favorite movies of all time. He did a really great improv of like different languages. I'd never seen anything like that or Singing in the Rain. I think that was one of my favorite movies growing up. It was, but but oh, yeah. you don't want to tell other... People were like, die hard, you know, and I was like, singing in the rain. <laughs> that wasn't the, probably not the best way to make, make a lot of friends. People, totally. people figured me out really quickly. But uh, yeah, so I started with that and then um, really just did every, mostly musicals. I didn't really do many straight plays, but I did a lot of musicals. Then I hit the uh, wonderful eighth grade, about to go into ninth grade, became self-aware, realized that was not cool where I was living. And uh, I, man, I caved to peer pressure and got out of acting and then got back into it when I could get my confidence and figure out who I was a little bit yeah, later. Right. Unfor I hate to say that. I hate to say I cowarded to the pressures of uh, masculinity and all that kind of stuff where I went to high school and things like that. But, uh, high school's tough, man. That's an awful yeah. time. I didn't fit in at all. <clears throat> high school I was this little dude. Brutal. Yeah, man. I didn't fit in at all. I went to a small 1A like farming kind of high school, Same here, yeah. you know, and um, in Eastern North Carolina and um, tried to leave the school because I just hated it so much. I just didn't fit in, transferred schools, went to a Christian school <laughs> <laughs> and then left that after the first month. And I was like, I think I'm better off back where I was. And um, so anyway, yeah, yeah, I just couldn't figure out where I fit in at all, man, you know. Yeah. So that's kind of how that goes. Well, small towns, too. I mean, there's not a lot of diversity and. And if you yeah. stand out or you have different interests, it's hard to find other people that have the same interests. Yeah, 100%, man. Yeah. I, yeah. Everybody's looking for their tribe. Yeah. You know, where do we fit in? And, and I, I just you didn't, I didn't fit one. in with the athletics thing as much as I would like to. I, I mean, I played tennis and, and, and was really good at that. Uh, and that was kind of my, well, what am I going to do now that I'm not performing? You know, yeah, until yeah. I started playing tennis. My sister was dating a tennis player, and I was like, this looks kind of easy. I'll try that. And I loved it, and I got addicted to tennis, and then yeah. that took over my life um, until, uh, yeah, until I taught a, an actor from Dawson's Creek, and then they, I was teaching him a tennis lesson, and then he was oh. like, oh, you should get back into it. <laughs> 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 well, I guess you're right. Yeah, I don't Washington. have to impress <laughs> now, my was high this? school people. Uh, that was maybe like 2006. Okay. Now, were you, were you a tennis pro? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, I turned pro. <laughs> Let me not overwhelm you with all this <laughs> magnitude of greatness. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I went to, I, I got a scholarship to, like, a Division two college to play. Okay. And then I transferred to North Carolina State. Did not make that starting squad. 
but started teaching tennis at a, a tennis club uh, for, for like Raleigh Parks and Recreation. Okay. It's called like River Birch Tennis Club. And so I started working there, started teaching children. Nobody wanted to teach the kids. I realized why <laughs> once I started teaching them. It was like six to eight-year-olds. I started teaching kids oh, wow. six to eight-year-olds. Oh, yeah. I'm just picking up tennis just balls the whole hour. Yeah. 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 But, um, but something about it was kind of interesting. I kind of liked being in charge. I felt like I was kind of safe out there, and some of them thought I was funny. You know, I could do little voices or things like that, you yeah. know. Um, and uh, my mom was really good with children, too. So it was kind of... I did a lot of imitation of her and I yeah. kind of copied her teaching style. And so I started getting better in teaching tennis and then one job kind of promoted to another. And then, and then, uh, the director there was like, Hey, would you like to coach your own team of middle schoolers, you know, middle school boys or something like that. And so that, okay, well, sure. I'll do that. And so by the time I graduated from NC state, I turned professional by certification through the United States professional tennis association, the USPTA. Oh, cool. So I did their, their testing certification stuff and scored I, I, the highest level, if you will. Wow. Uh, but I just, but somehow teaching kind of was a, a thing for me. It kind of came easy, um, relatively speaking. Uh, it was more, enjoy it didn't feel like work, I guess yeah, is yeah. what I'm trying to say. Um, not that it was easy, but it didn't feel labor intensive. And uh, um, yeah, so I was teaching, um, I taught at several different clubs, from private clubs to public clubs, and then I got asked to come to Greensboro. I was at a tennis teachers conference in Pinehurst, North Carolina, and I yeah. met the guy that runs Greensboro Tennis Program, their academy and all that kind of stuff. And he was like, hey, would you like to come and work with us? And I left the country club that I was at in Eastern North Carolina and, and moved here. I've been here ever since. And uh, that, was, that was after I graduated. It was probably like 2004. Okay. And then eventually you can't make any money <laughs> paying off student loans or anything like that teaching uh, for the city, oh, you know, yeah. parks and rec. I just, I think it was like 18 grand a year was the salary. Oh, wow. So I couldn't, I mean, you know, that was before taxes. <laughs> so, uh, and I was like, gosh, I really am not getting ahead in life. So I started working at a private tennis club called Ridgewood. Uh, in, like in Summerfield. Yeah. Sounds like a tennis club. Yep. Yeah, Ridgewood. <laughs> yes, Ridgewood. It was a phenomenal learning experience for me. I had a really great director there, Chris. And uh, that was when I met uh, an actor. Yeah, and I was, I was teaching tennis to his mom, and he was home for the summer. And so they were like, oh, he's, he was on Dawson's Creek. You remember that show? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Wilmington, you know? And, uh, and I was like, oh, I used to act. And he was, we talked about it. Why'd you get out of it? And really the rehearsals, I tried to get back into acting after I graduated from college. The rehearsals for doing theater were so demanding. I, I couldn't do that and on 18 grand still pay my bill. I had to have part-time right. jobs as well, you know? And uh, so in doing that, uh, he was like, oh, you should get into TV and film. And then that started that whole journey of... of uh, so what was your first move getting back into acting and going into TV and film? Um, what was the first move? I guess the first move uh, <laughs> was telling my boss at the tennis club, I don't think this is my dream to run a tennis club. Like, I'm working my way up the ladder. Yeah. But the next level is for me to start being in charge of a facility. And, and if this isn't the thing, teaching was fun. Um, but I don't know if I wanted to be the director of a club. Um, yeah. That's a very different set of skills than, than helping someone with technique on a court. That's management. That's a, and I didn't know if I really uh, was inspired to do that at that time. So, um, you know, I, I did tell him, I think I'm going to have to make a choice. And he, was, and he gave me the real world lesson of, hey, I really support that. However, <laughs> however, here's the deal. That means you can leave at any point in time. I need to start yeah. thinking of a backup. And if I start doing a search for a backup, now you have a shelf life of how long you can stay here. Do you really want to do that? And I thought about it and I just, yeah. So start finding my replacement and I'll leave whenever my replacement comes. I, um, That's great. He, he sounded like a good leader. I yeah. mean, it was a really, that was something that, you know, a 26 year old isn't going to really think about. I mean, hopefully a 26 year old to think about, but I didn't start getting smarter until I hit my thirties. Yeah. You know, I just didn't, I didn't think of the consequences of other people 
um, that I would work with or the concept of a team. You know what I mean? Um, I, think it's, I think it's good that you thought that way at 26, though, when you're thinking about your career. Because a lot of people fall into the trap of, yeah, yeah I don't want to take any chances. Like, I, I want to just, you know, I'm paying my yeah. bills. You know, things are working. I have yeah. opportunity here. You know, maybe this is the rut I should stay in. And yeah. you were like, no, oh, fuck this. I don't want to be yeah. in this. Like, let me <laughs> yeah. just go do what I want to do, even if I have to lose my job and, and start over. I think that's, that's the <sighs> right answer yeah most people would would allow the golden handcuffs to stay on and you basically yeah. had that opportunity you could have chose that path and just kind of almost mediocrity and and yeah i think i would have been good at running a tennis program i think i would have been good at it i don't know if i would have been great and that was the thing that i was um i just knew i would probably get burned out coasting yeah. I, was, I would probably get burned out being good um to quote whiplash <laughs> the two most <laughs> harmful words in the English language are good job yeah. because that means everybody has reached the, the status quo for that day. You're not going to get fired today. So that's good enough to go home. And, um, I don't know, you know, uh, I'm also a dreamer. So that, that's another hang up. Uh, it's a yeah. weakness and a strength at the same time. I was just kind of, is this what I'm going to be happy with forever? Um, that's not something you don't want to drop like 15. Here's the other thing. You don't want to drop 15 years becoming a tennis pro and then change your mind because although there's so many wonderful skills that you learn operating a club, I would potentially have to start from square one at any other business. Yeah. I mean, those skills would definitely translate. You know what I'm trying to say, oh, yeah. but, but yeah. on paper, a resume, when people would look at that, I'm a novice, even though I could say, well, I did the accounting, I understand billing, I understand customer service, communication, marketing, I understand these things, but for, for tennis balls, not for <laughs> anything well, else. Yeah, you know, a lot of businesses work similar, so you probably had a lot of qualifications for that, but it's not where you, you didn't have a passion for it, though. You didn't want to be sure. stuck in some corporate management type job. Yeah. And, I mean, you're an actor, so you're, you're an entrepreneur through that yeah <laughs> and you, you, you're still you're really still in management too because you you manage a really good acting studio yeah but i love that but it's, so it's that, almost like I, you I figured it out though. that's actually where i started fitting not fitting in but that's where i started feeling like oh i belong here is when i was like i like management marketing accounting i like these things but maybe it was i needed to be under a different umbrella and right. when i got into acting and i well when i remember telling chris Hey, this is my decision. I remember telling him that on an, maybe I should have told him on a Friday at five. I told him <laughs> on a Monday morning at 8 a.m. <laughs> right before we started the summer. Yeah. Uh. You know, and he, and I remember him just going, ah, you're going to, this is our first day of summer. Like, and I hadn't really included the timing of that. Yeah. You know, now I would, I'd be very, uh, aware, self-aware of, uh, affecting someone else. Some people don't care, but, but I was taught to care about other people as well, if, especially yeah, if you have a relationship sure. with them. And, and he was a really great boss. A, he really took care of me. Actually, I've had phenomenal bosses in all of my tennis jobs. Um, and I would say the reason I do well, uh, running the acting studio is because of all of those, um, the unique uh, talents and characteristics that those bosses uh, in the tennis world um, kind of handed over to me. Kind of mentors. So, I, yeah. I mean, I just remember like Tom Cascarano at Greensboro Country Club was really great for me. A polarizing figure there, which probably means you're doing a good job to a certain extent if people don't know whether they love right. you or hate you, um, but they at least have an opinion. And um, he was so good to me. And, and, you know, probably, sure, let's get therapeutic here. Probably because my dad left when I was six months old. I'm always looking for a father figure. <laughs> so anyone who kind of gives me definites and absolutes, I tend to respect a little bit more. So, sure, I get that. Okay. <laughs> but um, but he, um, he had a lot of uh, – he would probably do really well if he ran a, a, an acting studio. Yeah. You know, I think he would. The, the things that he, I kind of watched him do and learn. Um, and one um, Christmas, we decided we were going to give him a gift. All right. The, us pros that work there. And as, uh, two other pros, David and Mark. They were really cool and good friends of mine. And so we decided we were going to give him a gift. And we 
made bathroom tiles of his regular quotes, like 10 quotes. He says, every week we're hearing the same quotes from Tom. <laughs> and we found this thing on like Pinterest and Etsy where you could like make bathroom tiles and, or they were like coasters. They look like bathroom tiles, but they'd be, yeah. you would make them coasters yeah, yeah. and they would have his like quotes on it, like Tomisms. But actually when I, when we were really thinking, what does Tom say all the time? And it was a joke for us. Uh, like, like he would say things like, Drew, if you can't say what you're trying to say in 10 seconds or less on the court, their heart rate has stopped. Like, <laughs> what we knew what we meant was yeah. stop giving a monologue. If you can't say it in seven to 10 seconds, don't interrupt what they're doing right yeah. now as a coach. And um, unfortunately, I'm talking a lot right now, but, <laughs> but you that's, asked. That's the point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you asked. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, it, but when you're working out, when you're exercising as a pro, if the, I got to stop point. you, yeah, let's yeah. get it to the point. The 10-second yeah. tip, 10 or less, 10 or less seconds. You got to figure out what you're going to say and, or don't stop their momentum. Because yeah. if you're calling a timeout to work with an elite pro athlete, you, you got to say it in less than 10 seconds and it's got to hit home and it's got to be yeah. summarized. And, and, not, you know, and I think that was one thing in working with – uh, especially the kids that I work with at the studio that have got, done really well, can I say what I need to say in 10 seconds or less to them so they can not get out of the moment? Yeah. Uh, I, which tell, is I tell important. employees, if you have bad news, tell me quickly. Yeah. yeah. Don't, don't build it up and make it yeah, dramatic and, yeah. and, and, and cause a bunch of anxiety just to get Completely to the point. Completely agree. <laughs> we don't need the crescendo <laughs> right. yeah. for, for that. We don't need momentum for that. We... we yeah. yeah, but he had so many wonderful things. Like, I remember him saying one time, I, I wanted to work with this customer, and I was like, well, maybe I'll make an exception. And he said, if you make an exception, you might as well hand me your resignation. Wow. And he was like, once you do it, they own you. Now you need to figure out, is it worth them owning you? And he was right. Once I made an exception, that, that member of, that, of the club owned me all the time. They would no longer use the process for signing up for a lesson. They would text me at different times. I now became a, um, you know, like a, a personal assistant to them, and right. I lost that, um, that instructor uh, authority yeah, figure, yeah. if you will. You know yeah. that that mm -hmm. that kind of, not a pedestal, but you know what I mean. Uh, you know, once you start cutting deals for people and news spreads, and he was always like, "News is going to spread. You cut a deal for one person, it's Everybody ask yourself accept you know, it or expect yeah. it." Yeah. Yeah, and so I know those are kind of basic things, and every company has to figure out what what's perfect for their demographic, their clientele, things like that. Right. But um, that was beneficial for me. Um, there was just so many other things that, you know, that they, they kind of taught me in the tennis world. And that's where I was like, when it came to acting, I found so many acting schools boring uh, just because they were based upon uh, tradition and nothing yeah. modern anymore. Like the average acting studio really teaches the same way their teachers taught. Mm -hmm. And their teachers taught the way their teachers taught. And, and that all goes back to stadium seating. Everybody waits their turn. Maybe you'll perform tonight and I'll tell you what I think about it and you need my approval to move on. And um, I didn't like that. Um, I just thought there was a better way of conducting business. Right. And in the tennis world, you would be slaughtered the the customer is right like if you work for the the membership of a country club hey if they don't like your lesson it doesn't matter how many ncaa trophies i have i could lose my job you know yeah, that's yeah. a bit extreme but you understand what i'm yeah, saying yeah, um yeah. truly and i remember being told uh by chris at the other club he was like drew you're right wink but you're going to be wrong at the end of the day. I want you to know that <laughs> you're going to be wrong. Is it worth it? Is it worth being right to lose this customer? Is it worth it? Can you find some common ground? I challenge you to call them and find some common ground before you make your decision. Okay. All right. You know, those are hard things to do, but those are great lessons for me. And, yeah. and, and acting's uh, not really like that though. For, for, for my experience, um, it seems a little more selective. Yeah, I mean, it can be. Uh, the actual acting process, yeah. 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 I mean, it's, because, I mean, it's you know, I, I think with a tennis club member, if they're just trying to be a better tennis player, you know, mm -hmm. it is what it is. But if, if it's an actor trying to become a professional actor, they have to be really good. And if they don't want to listen, then, you know, why, why waste your time with them? Because there's a lot of people that want to 
train? Yeah, there. I would say, you know, I have a dream of God. <laughs> you dreamer. Stop. You dreamer. Stop it. <laughs> uh, my dream has been to perform in front of people, in front of a camera. Yeah. There's absolutely nothing more rewarding for me, fulfilling. It's a childhood dream. And so I know what it feels like to think about it, to obsess over it, to lie in bed at night, to wonder how will it ever happen? Do I have what it takes? I kind of, I know those questions, personal questions. I know what it's like to be a coward and not rise to the occasion. I know what it's like to be thrown into something and not be prepared. I know what it's like to absolutely be prepared. I know what it's like to feel like top dog. So, I, and that typically happens every month, all those things yeah. every month. <laughs> and, um, but I had somebody tell me this and it was kind of a super spiritual hippie thing, right? And I loved it. You don't have to co-sign on this idea at all. <laughs> but um, he basically was talking to me about the golden rule, like do unto others as you would have them do unto you, yeah. okay? And so he said, all right, I'll tell you how you can figure out if you're meant to do something is figure out and identify what your dream is, find somebody else with the same dream and help them get it first. That's the golden rule. Oh, That's the real golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I think the success of where my students have come is uh, when they train with me and they say, this is my dream, I say, I know exactly how you feel. It's mine too. I'll oh, get yeah. you there before me and I'll meet you on set. Let me get you first and then I'll be there to join you. And that's created a very different vibe. Uh, I think that's why all of a sudden we went from, I started with like four children that I was teaching. And then it was like, in two years, it was like 127. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot, but for one person. That's a lot, yeah. yeah. It's, it was a lot for me. That's why I had to get help, because I just had so many coming. Yeah. But that was because I took their dream very seriously. Now, I tried to set up a system where if they weren't able to handle it, we had a litmus test where we would both know, here's what I think we should be doing, because I've done it first. Now, you can try it your way, and I'll support it. Maybe you have an idea that I need to learn. But here's our litmus test. Now, if you don't think you want to do this work, I'm not certain whether you want to do this career. Right. But if, but, and then I also help them find another place to go. Like, I'll send them to another place to train, too, right, because yeah. there's also the outlier that I'm just not right for them, yeah, too. Yeah. But that seemed to make people pretty loyal in, in the, like, okay, this dude's showing up for me, and, yeah. and okay. Um, and so anyway, but that's how the studio kind of grew was because I was like, all right, I'm, all right, this is your dream. Do you prompt? I mean, are you for real? This is your dream? Tell me why it's yeah. your dream. It's my dream too. But let's train hard because one of us might not be here next week because our dream has come to fruition. So let's crush it. And it kind of created this momentum and this intensity in class, even with children, you know, even because I still teach like the seven to, you know, seven year olds. And yeah, I, yeah. But they don't understand that per se, so I don't really put the dream on the line for a right. seven-year-old. Yeah. But um, is their life still a dream? Yeah, I mean, really you can't, you, you know, not to get into like crazy actors talk here, but you know, certain techniques you you don't want to use on young children. Their brains are still totally developing. You don't want to. Yeah. You don't want to alter the joy and the innocence that they have. You don't want to, like, let's talk about what it's like to lose about a About choices and stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah you don't want to, I mean, so, you yeah. know, so really teaching from an imagination uh, point of view or, or um, you know, creating um, fantasy. My wife hates it when I say fantasy. Well, a lot of it's natural for fantasy. kids, though. Oh, they do it all the time. Like, yeah. My daughter, she's four. Like, we start playing Barbies, and after five minutes, we're truly in the Barbie dream house, even though we're just holding the Barbies on the cabinets, you know, on the counter, yeah, yeah. but boom, it's, it's a mansion and everything. We've got different voices. Yeah, I mean, that's what I love about it. I love that, that, um, imagination and, yeah. you know, turning a vision into reality. I love that. So oh, yeah. I don't know if I answered any of your questions. <laughs> no, oh, yeah. I kind of I mean, went, I I think, went into uh, a different different world there. No, it sounds a lot like where I studied, you know, at the Actors Lab. Yeah. Uh, shout out to JD. Um, yeah, man. But uh, we we had a similar thing too. Is is um, you know, we we were we had expectations. You know, everybody 
he had to show up to all the classes. Yeah. Uh, there was an interview process to get into the school. There was a, a list. And I think you do the same thing, right? You do yeah. an interview. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just you just want to make sure that people are there because they really want to be there. Right. And and uh, and sometimes there'll be people that just didn't they didn't vibe or they didn't want to learn the curriculum, I guess, or the way. And yeah. and it was real interactive the way we did. It. I think from what I, I understand from you is, is you guys kind of do a lot of the interactive. Yeah, I get bored if classes people, too. I mean, I, it's an. I know I'm not doing a good job as a teacher if all of a sudden I, I can low-key see somebody over here picking up their phone and like doing something. I'm like, they were not yes. inspired by any performance. They weren't inspired by me or my knowledge. Nothing was inspirational to them. So. It's disrespectful. That's a, it yeah. is. It, it, but it's, and it's so habitual for so many, of, well, especially my young kids yeah. or my high schools. It's habitual for them. They, they can't go five minutes without. They need a, a, a check. they got to have a stimulus Something's got to stimulate them. Yeah, they, they <laughs> yeah. got to do that. So I understand that. And so I, I understand part of training is I've got to break them out of that habit and yeah. turn them into um, a human again. <laughs> yeah, they, they got to be like, yeah. absolutely. It has to be a, a voyeuristic experience if you're in, like, you truly have to watch and study. You have to be able to participate. Yeah. I also want them to know everything that I know. Right. Because when they go to set, you know I can't go with them unless they get approval from a studio and hire me as a con on a contract to go and coach oh, yeah. them. They have to coach themselves. You have to be self-sufficient. That was the greatest thing that I learned in being a tennis pro. You know, when you turn, when you're playing in like junior tournaments or in college, uh, referees don't show up unless you have a problem. So yep. you have to have uh, an argument and, a, and an obstacle and a problem on the tennis court, then you have to call the referee to come in and they will then like mitigate the, you know, the, uh, you know mediate the scenario. Right. And, and so, and that becomes then like, who's the better at, who's the better attorney? So the judge is like, well, son, what happened? And you're like, well, he called my ball out. And he's like, it was out. And you're like, I think it was on the line. Well, let's play the point. And you're like, uh. Oh. So you, I had to learn in tennis like how to stand up for myself, how to negotiate. Well, you know, when you when you start playing in small tournaments or small minor league tournaments, very rarely are you, you don't. It's not like TV. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's brutal, <laughs> and you only get paid if you win. Uh -huh. You know, TV tennis is a little different. You know, yes. than, than minor leagues and and small junior circuits and stuff. So, um, where you're just playing for pride and points, um, right. and. Uh, so when you teach someone in tennis, you got to teach them how not to need the coach, how to think for themselves. So you, you can't hold secrets. That was one thing I didn't like about traditional acting classes. People were like, well, you know, how do I get an agent? Do you really want me to tell you? I mean, I can sit down and tell you. It's going to take 30 minutes, but I'll tell you. Not you guys, but that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? You know what I mean? And I'm like, well, if you really want to know, is that how you want to spend your lesson? Do you want me to tell you? Because you're not good enough to have one. But I'll tell you. I won't keep a secret from you if you want to know. But I don't know if you're ready to hear that. Um, and I typically present it like that. Well, the traditional acting studio would say, you're not ready for that. <laughs> Which I understand. There's a lot of truth in that. But I let the customer decide, do they want to know? Yeah, do you yeah. really want to know what's wrong with your vehicle? <laughs> uh, <laughs> or do you yeah. want me to just give you a bill and fix it? So, Because um, I like the education of it. Yeah, that was what we, we, that was part of our training, too, was yeah. learning about getting an agent and how to market yourself, how to promote yourself as an actor. Yeah. And, and also, you know, it's not just about the class. It's about every day you're out of the class, too. You know, it's just working on your craft daily. That's a yeah. million-dollar statement. That's <laughs> <laughs> what you do outside. Of, oh, my gosh. That's why I'm not famous. <laughs> I got to do stuff outside of class. No, I, you know, I, I'm just playing. I, you're 100% right. Yeah. So it's funny how many people – that's why you have to kind of meet people ahead of time before they come and train with you or join you because so many people have no clue what self-promotion is. They have no clue what it's like to be in business for yourself. Right. And you're an independent contractor as an actor. That's all you do. Yeah. I mean, from 1099s to everything, that's all, all you do. All the responsibilities on you. A hundred percent. And um, gosh, there was so many things I... I just wish I could have learned earlier, but whatever. That's how. Eh, that's life. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. God, totally. if I would have had my brain here. now, yeah. at 26, guys, that would be awesome. <laughs> we, we've had this <laughs> conversation so awesome. before, but but you do have that brain now. Yeah. I do have that brain now. <laughs> so. Well, I'll tell you though, the other side of that is is 
Uh, my brain wasn't fully developed at 26 either. Um, and I did very well by 25. Actually, very well by probably 20, early 20s. But, yeah. but yeah. by uh, everybody else's standards, by 25, clearly doing a great job. The problem with getting it so early is this has informed, right? Yeah. And you end up losing, potentially, you end up losing everything and having to restart. So now you mm-hmm. end up with statements like, yeah, actually, I'm thankful that I went through what I went through, and I'm thankful for those problems. Mm-hmm. I'd rather have a, let's say, a $10 million problem than a $100 million problem. So in your case, you'd rather have a problem at 26 than you would at, I don't know how old you are, but 40, 40. Yeah. Right. You don't look 40. You look, no. like, thank you so you look much. like you're about 28. Yeah. Thank you. That's, I'm probably, my Damn agent's it. probably like, why did you say your name? Uh, why did you say your age? Now, people yeah, know. Yeah. now I, I get it. You're just trying to, you're, you're setting it higher than what it really is. You're really, no, 28. you know what? It's like, I, I'm not, I haven't lied about my age, but I was so glad when I had my, I turned 40, uh, two months ago. He's actually older than me. And I was yeah. so glad when people younger. were like, oh, so who's, who's the boss here at the, uh, at the company, at the studio? And you're like, oh, it's me. <laughs> and they see me wearing like Andre Agassi tennis shoes and, <laughs> and T-shirts. And they're like, well, where's the grown up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you look <laughs> and every, I was like, every man, I, So it's kind of, it's like a, it helps actually, you know, from an agent and my manager perspective. Oh, sure. They do pitch me for like 28 to 38 year old roles. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's great. And so there's a big advantage in that. He has a hookup at at the uh, Harvard genetics department. Oh yeah. 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 My mom's Irish (laughs) and Uh. made us wear sunscreen all the time. Uh. Yeah. We didn't go outside a lot because we were learning those damn musicals. (laughs) (laughs) No, it was, yeah, it's funny. I also didn't, I also didn't drink, never smoked. Just healthy lifestyle. Never did drug. Yeah, Yeah. I just. I think that's what it was. No, I didn't. I've learned a lot more thanks to my wife about clean eating, which uh, I was not educated properly on that. But I think it's probably because I didn't drink, smoke, or yeah, you have great drugs genetics or too, man. Like yeah. that. I, I've had a healthy, healthy lifestyle too, and it. I mean, I, I feel like I, I look pretty good for forty. I'll be yeah. forty this month, but I don't look like I'm twenty-eight. Well, let me also backtrack on the drinking comment because I do love drinking now, but <laughs> it's only because I'm like a member of a Scotch society. I was seeing your Glenn Fittick over here. And I was like, all right. I was like, hey, guys, I didn't know I should have brought some. I love a single malt. You can have at it. I love it. It's a little early right now, but I love it. Yeah, I got to have it. at. The... Oh, man, there's a great uh, Robert Burns party, uh, a great um, a Scottish poet, and, and so... Uh, there's a party every year that I go to, like a private party, for and everybody brings single malts, and it's yeah, it's incredible. I love it. I have, if you guys want to come, yeah, let me sure. know, man. Oh, yeah, come yeah, on yeah. over. Yeah, yeah, that'd be awesome. We'll get a we'll get a ride share home. Sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not driving. I love stuff like that. But anyway, it's probably I think I like drinking now for um, I actually like the flavor, the complexities, and then I take like educational courses on how to taste oh, yeah. wines and stuff like that. But you know. Anyway. So you appreciate it, yeah. You're, you're I not totally you're not drinking it. to get drunk, shit face. Like no, eight, like no, no, like no. you're 18. Like let's get fucked up. Oh man, I miss those. <laughs> I, I I missed those. I don't miss those days. I missed. Like I, I them, never yeah. had those days. I had I had a few of them. One of them ended with me trying to tackle a steel beam that was supporting a uh, <laughs> second see? story balcony. I don't have nice. that. I, that yeah. sucked. I you know what? I was like the you know, if you talk to my college. Uh, teammates and and the people I went to high school they would think I was some stuck up prude who looked down on every, and I was at the time I you know I'm not suggesting that underage drinking was cool or anything like that but I was very militant against them yeah. and so I, that probably didn't help right and right, not yeah. having friends either <laughs> that's probably why I didn't get invited anywhere well, um, oh gosh I I owe so many people apologies for how much I incorrectly and arrogantly judge them based upon my religious beliefs at the time. And so I'm so sorry to those guys. Yeah. But so that's, sorry. you know, when you're young and you're, you have ideologies, yeah. it's, it, you're, you're programmed to be that way. Yeah. And it takes, it was my parents. Some belief. people never get out of it. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, you know, some people just stay that way forever. What do they yeah. call that? Uh, that, um, that, that, where you're all sharing the same ideas. Brainwashing. Yeah. That, <laughs> that too, that too. It's like echo chamber. Yes. Like yes. you grew echo up in chamber, that, yeah. right? Everybody does. Yeah. They grow up in this echo chamber where they, I do. yeah, yeah. You and only you believe the things your parents believe. Right. Yeah. And then you get to step out of that. And I it really, was hard. It was hard stepping yeah. out. And I didn't, I didn't, it, well, 
Uh, do, you know what really got me out of my beliefs? This is crazy. What got me out of my hardcore liturgical far right-wing Christian beliefs was going and working for a Christian production talent agency company. Oh, huh. oh, you got to see all the it problems was, with people. <laughs> that was right as I was hitting my quarter life crisis. Yeah. Right as I decided I was going to leave tennis. And at, at the time I heard information about this Christian company kind of coming through and they were like, we help people get into Hollywood and, uh, for Christ. And, um, and I, and I did that. And, um, um, uh, man, you know, it was, uh, there's so many wonderful people there. Um, and then the way it was kind of operated, I started questioning things. I'm not suggesting that that company like turned me into an atheist. I'm not suggesting that. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying what it did was it made me say, oh, now wait a minute. There are, we all have apparently come from a church and we have all read this book a little differently. Hmm. Because it was, it was just Christians. So it was every kind of Christian. Right. But the, but the Protestant expected you to think like the, the, the uh, mega church person like, that expected you to think like the small town Southern Baptist church. And so we all were like, that kind of started it. And then I went to, um, <laughs> oh, this is bad. I went and <laughs> there was a church in Winston, Salem, right? And uh, I, don't think they're, I don't think they're there anymore. And when you join the church, uh, I got a part of their drama team, right? And, and you have to like join something. So if you were a new member at this church, you had to join yeah, yeah. Um, and, and some kind of ministry. So I joined this ministry and it was the production, like production film, because they, they air their yeah. TV show, you know, or their sermons, whatever, Sunday, whatever. And I remember them all of a sudden teaching me. <laughs> uh. It's so bad. You know what I'm gonna say, how we have to use production to manipulate the at-home audience. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't say that word. The, the actual phrase was, all right, so we're going to show you how to work the lights and the sound, and we had to orchestrate with the... To affect people's emotions and stuff, yeah. Yeah, man. It's, that, it's a performance. Yeah. It um, absolutely devastated me. I think what got me, though, because, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a Christian background and mm -hmm. with people that really believed it. You know what I mean? People that oh, yeah. lived it, believed it. Yeah. And I believed Same. it yeah. to a fault. Yeah. 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 And as, as I got older, I started really getting into science, technology, and reading. And then I'm like, okay, so Homo sapiens have been here for over 300,000 years for sure. Yeah. And cognitively, we've been very similar for the past 70 plus thousand years. And there are currently about 10,000 different religions mm -hmm. on the planet. The oldest religion is about 15,000 years old, and it was... Um, some type of pre-Hinduism religion. Yeah. So I'm like, we have no idea what anything <laughs> is. We're just making shit up so we can I control know. people and, and keep people in line because, I mean, really our whole society is a construct that we just choose to believe in and that's why it works. Yeah. And it's very important that we believe in the construct, you know, and, make, and, and, and we keep society stable. And I think for a long time, religion was a big part of that. You know, it helped. Sure. It gave us a lot of answers. Because, you know, people have originally evolved to be in small groups of maybe 150 people. Mm -hmm. And now we're in huge groups, you know, and, it's, and that's fairly new. That's over the past couple yeah. thousand years that we've had these larger societies. And I think, you know, religion helped control these large groups of people because, you know, if you all believe in the same thing, you're sort of connected that way. Yeah, you have that common denominator, yeah. and you can, and then you, and you, it, it yeah. causes moral agreements and stuff too. Sure, because then you have something you can always reference back to. Right, right. Well, yeah, I'm not going to kill you because here's, let's come back to, to the yeah. lesson plan. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You're supposed to serve the tennis ball this way. We've all agreed. <laughs> yeah. This is how it starts. <laughs> These are the rules of the tennis game. Yes. Okay, guys. Yes. You're not following the rules. No. We all agreed. <laughs> Yeah, you right know here. <laughs> I love religion, but I can't stand it at the same time. I, I'm fascinated by religion because of how I was, I was raised. Yeah. I was heavily indoctrinated and, and spoon-fed a lot of information. But um, 
I kind of had this, uh, yeah, what a trite phrase. I had my spiritual awakening, you know, when I started hitting my thirties yeah. and I remember, I remember writing all of my incredibly dogmatic Christian friends and I wrote them a letter. I was inspired by this uh, preacher turned atheist, Dan Barker, who does the freedom from religion podcast. I got into that for a while just cause I'm, I was, you know, man, Hey, yeah. I was crazy, dude. I, <laughs> <laughs> I worked for that church and learned that we were manipulating. And I was, I was off the walls. I was like, yeah. so the truth I did, is out. Yeah. And I, so, but it was, it was crazy because the same uh, energy that I was telling everybody that like, you're wrong, you're going to hell. You have to believe what I believe. All of a sudden when I was like, wait a minute, I might have been wrong. And I had that same fervor to go and tell. So I, so I wrote this letter to my. Just probably still from the same ideology. Sure, and the I, same and source. Yeah, and yeah. I and I wrote them, and I just said, guys, I absolutely cannot tell you I have guarantees any longer. I am so sorry. It was a very it sounds kind of dumb, but it was a very powerful moment it. in my life, and I was just like, I have told you so many things about what was right and wrong, and I'm here to tell you, I don't know those answers anymore. And some people felt I was a coward for admitting that, like, oh, man, you sold yourself out. You don't have any, you have no foundation anymore. Um, but what I was really suggesting to them was um, I'm actually going to research things with my own eyes right. now yep. Yep. because I don't want my belief system to be based upon somebody else's word or hearsay or my friend told me this, so I got to believe it. Yep. You know, um, I think I would like for my opinions to be based upon my personal research instead of just taking somebody else's word for it. And, and that started that whole movement. And I was a really big, let's bring it back to acting. <laughs> I was a big Meisner actor at the time, a very dogmatic style of you yeah, know, yeah. two years, very militant, hardcore. It's probably why I loved it. I needed a father figure. And, <laughs> and all of a sudden, then it was, um, maybe there's another style of acting. So I got into like, I got into more Strasbourg work and then I got into, really got into Chekhov and Alexander techniques. And then I started realizing like, man, there's something wonderful and sometimes detrimental about all of these acting styles, yeah. religions, because uh, that's what they are. Kind of. You yeah. know, everybody's trying to get to heaven set, you know, trying to get on set and uh, use our way. It's the truth. And, uh, Everyone else is wrong. Yeah, yeah. man. Yeah. But, it, but I'm, it's funny, I get it, tennis, acting and religion, they're all similar. Cause I did have one person tell me, they're like, well, what's your teaching philosophy at the studio you operate? And I said, um, well, I would consider us an all American methodology. And he was like, I need to know where you stand. Are you Meisner? Are you Strasburg? Are you Stanislavski? What is it? And I was like, kind of a hybrid of what I think really is. <laughs> That's actually is. how we were trained, too, as a hybrid. Sure, of course. Yeah. Like, don't, and, don't get caught up in one thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Do and, what works. And, uh, yeah. and I remember this dude chastising me on social media, and he was like, I can't trust an acting school that doesn't have a firm foundation in what they believe in. And <laughs> it sounds wishy-washy and, you know, want to be hot or cold. You can't be lukewarm. And I was like, okay. <laughs> he just All replaced right. acting. Yeah. He replaced Jesus with acting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you basically just. Isn't that what <laughs> acting teachers are? They're like preachers and, gurus, and yeah. yeah, little gurus and stuff like that. And you that basically just done. decided that you didn't want him as a client <laughs> or student. He, yeah, he broke up with me first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was it. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> so, anyway. You know, I'm not, I'm not atheist, but I'm just, I, I would consider myself agnostic because I think we just don't know. Like, we don't know. What. I was atheist for a long time. Well, for a couple of years, which felt like a long time to yeah. everybody that was praying for my soul. <laughs> but, then, but even then, I had a couple of other experiences, kind of weird, um, unique for me, where I was like, well, maybe I'm wrong with that. Yeah. I want to be open. Because we don't know what this is. I don't know anymore. Yeah. That was my thing is, yeah. I can't tell. I, while, you know, the same certainty that I used to tell everybody, I'm right, you're wrong. I can't do that anymore. I'm going to have to spend more time listening There's to really you. no way to truly prove what reality is. I know a lot of scientists now are leaning towards time and space may not even be real. It may just all be sure. data. We may all be in one <laughs> we finite could, point of data. We and could be everything in a is just parallel perception. universe. Yeah, or the there could be multiverse. infinite universe. Multiverse, we got all kinds yeah, of the scenarios. mini worlds yeah. theory and all that stuff. It's 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 uh This could also be a program. I've you know, I've uh 
Oh, God, I don't want to go into these. <laughs> no, can't believe yeah, I just went there. there. We could be in like uh, uh, some kind of virtual program. A simulation. I mean, yeah. A simulation. Yeah. I mean, I've I mean read it's, all it's that very too. possible. You know, it, it wouldn't be a simulation like what we think of as a simulation. Sure. It would be something much more complex and, and sure. And, and I love all this thing. But, but you know, what was crazy was when I opened my mind. Like I said, which some people really believe that's a weakness of mine. Um, but to me, it gave me a lot of strength and power to be a better, a better friend to a lot of people. It eliminated a lot of judgment for me because I could be wrong. So yeah, I might as well right. actually listen to what you have to say and, and let judgment come from somewhere else instead of me. So anyway. I, I kind of did this, got to the same conclusion, did it differently. But like for me, it was about... All right, so let's say I think you're wrong. Mm -hmm. The best way for me to prove that you're wrong is to learn more than you know about that subject. Yeah. So I want to learn your wow, perspective. What a, wait, that is awesome <laughs> what you just said. Hold on, my brain is processing that. <laughs> I, yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so, so that's so what right. I would do. I would literally, I would be like, you know what? I'm going to assume everything that you're saying is true. At fa I'm going to take it face value, and then I'm going to take it a step further. I'm going to go to these sources... Yeah. And I'm just going to research the hell of this, and I'm going to learn it. I'm going to take it in, and I'm going to go, okay. Because if you know it that well, you yes. can poke holes in it, right? That's what we had to do in pre-law. Because I went to North Carolina State to study politics. I was going to go into law. When you do debating, in our debate classes, you have to figure out what are all of my weaknesses. Yeah. And I got to know more than, That's right. than yeah. the presenter. So I need to know your, your side of it. I need yeah. to be able to articulate it better than you can, right? And yes. argue it better yes. than you can. I need to be as staunch an advocate as you can. I need the ability to do that. So, but here, here's what happened though. In doing so, it also opened, brought my perspective. Mm -hmm. And if you do this over a period of years, over a period of, of topics, all of a sudden you go, well, wait a second. You start to, well, like the same thing that you went through yeah. is, you go, wait a second. There, there's more to this than just my, the previous tunnel vision that I had and these previous ideologies I had based on maybe my parents or my environment or this box that I was put in. And you really start to go, well, actually, that, that, that there's some, I can disagree with some of what you're saying, but still agree that some of the things you say are right. Like you don't have to always be wrong. Right. Like we get this political thing. If you're a Democrat, oh, and, and I, let's say I was Republican, you're a Democrat. Everything Democrat says is wrong. Everything Republican says is wrong. If you take that type of mentality, now we're just playing. Um, they're at war. They're at war. They're on yeah. teams. What's the word? Uh, it's tribalism. Tribalism, it's right? Same thing. Yeah. Right. Now we're just, that, that's not, that doesn't work. But now I need to be able to look at it and go, you know what? There are some things that I really like about this. Yeah. Here's the things I don't. And there's things I like about this. And they're different. Like, they're completely opposing. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to – and I figured out this thing. I'm like, man, I actually like some things from this and some things from this. Yeah. I end up in the same place, yeah. but I just kind of went about it differently. It's called yeah. being reasonable. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, <laughs> something. I don't know. Yeah, I think I mean, it's a lot to do with empathy, too. Yeah. I think mm. we don't need religion in society. We need empathy. We need to all respect and care about each other and, and – like, I don't care what you do as long as you're not affecting my life yeah. in a negative yeah. way. You know, we should all be trying to do things to help each other and, you know, do the best we can ourselves yeah. while respecting each other. And that's, you don't have to have some archaic religion to tell you to respect someone else's life. Yeah. <laughs> I know? did have somebody ask me that the other day. I posted a thing about um, um, supporting people that... Uh, um, that had been silenced and, and didn't feel like they were represented well. And, and um, anyway, and, and, and they were like, where are you getting your basis for morality, Drew? Like, where is this happening from? <laughs> and I was like, uh, their theory was because I don't believe in their version of the, their Christian God that I could no longer determine right from wrong. And I remember um, in the, the God Delusion by Richard Dawkins. I remember reading that and him actually having a very, and I, it was blowing my mind because as a Christian for so long and I'm reading an atheist talking Dawkins about is like, awesome, yeah. I remember him saying like, actually, as long as you try not to cause physical or emotional harm to a, to a living creature, that should be, <laughs> yeah. that, that kind of could be enough. You don't actually need a religion to do that. And I, I remember being like, what? This guy? What? <laughs> what? How can you say that? 
It's supposed to come from this and this way only. Now, look, I, but I also have so many friends that are, that are uh, they would label themselves born-again believers, Christians. And we get along really well, too, because I totally yeah. get where they're coming from. Yeah, I still respect it, yeah. yeah. I, I, and, you know, um, that was one thing that, um, it is funny, at our studio we have people of all walks of faith and, and non-faiths. Right. And I love that. And I love that it keeps us kind of accountable that, because there's always somebody that will start talking, assuming everybody in the class <laughs> is exactly on the same level. Well, that's another thing too that Thank you me. realize when you get as you get older. As, as long as you're you're trying to expand your your yeah. mind and and meet new people and stuff, you start to realize like, oh, we're all like people have very different beliefs. Yeah, you know, like it's not mm-hmm. everyone wasn't raised the same mm-hmm. as me. <laughs> like sure. You know, so. Who were we with the other day? And we said... Adversity. You know. um, mm-hmm. We were talking to a client, and I'm trying to remember what it was about, which state, but basically, um, I, think, I think the guy's name was Priol. But, but either way, he, he had all these ideas. He was so excited. Maybe it's Haroon. But either way, he's, oh, yeah. he's wildly successful, right, in and, and mm-hmm. other industries, and he was trying to grow into this industry. And he's like, but listen, can't we change the way that this makes people feel? Can't we change this gray cloud Hmm. that's over this business, can I go in and redo it? And I was like, look, it's not your job to to change how other people receive this, right? Hmm. Your target demographic. Ah, That's the stand-up comedy uh, theology. You don't, I don't have to, this is not, I don't need to bring these people in. Like I, you need to focus on, on providing value to your target market, your client, your demographic. Your job is not to convince everybody else and change their belief systems, right? Yeah. And I feel like that's, you know, that's also something that to become really aware of is like, I can be, I've got friends that are completely different views, backgrounds, everything, and we can all get along. Good. And I love that, right? Yeah. My job, nor theirs, which we've talked about, is not to convince the others that they're wrong, right? Like it's, I, I that's the only thing I hate about some, I've got families that are, uh, uh, my grandparents are pastors and ministers. I mean, like I've, I've got sure this, this thing, and I, I hate... If you're not on my team, everything you do is wrong. Everything you say is wrong. Everything is invalid. Right. And they take it as their per- and they is not anybody specific. Take it as their personal mission to prove everything you do is wrong or invalid and try to convince you to do it their way. And I hate yeah. that. Right. Well, back to what you said earlier yeah, too. I think you 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 basically were saying you look at everything objectively. Yeah. And and that's the way you should look mm-hmm. at things because I mean you, your ideas should even evolve. Yeah. I yeah. agree. So, I mean, we, we have yeah. to be adaptable. Yeah, I wonder why um, sometimes people get critiqued. Uh, maybe it just scares people to know that someone else is changing. I, I'd really like to, I guarantee there's some kind of study on that. It's, it's, yeah. I, think, I think what it is, <clears throat> and I've talked about this recently with you too, is I think we're, we're in, a, in an age, we may be in the singularity, you know, the technological singularity yeah. right now, most likely, because things are changing so yeah. rapidly on, on top of their own speed yeah built, and we yeah. suddenly have access to so much information just infinite amounts of information and knowledge that we can share and 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 take in and it's overwhelming and i think a lot of people i think these these core beliefs that people have held for centuries are now being challenged and i think we're mm. seeing this it's like an upset of society it's like people are like like they're like like oh yeah i feel like <laughs> like things are falling apart or like yeah. they're scared i think it's a fear thing i think because a lot of people are grounded by religion and, and ideology and stuff like that and and now they're being challenged constantly mm. on these beliefs and i think it's, it's really scaring people and two things i remember my mother i, I don't should I, I don't know if i should tell this story <laughs> I, I love my i love my mother more than anything she's yeah, my yeah. hero of course i think that goes without saying right uh, yeah, yeah i agree i agree with you I, i'm not your mother mine Sure, of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah, you would love my mom too. She's yeah. awesome. Fair enough. She fair does enough. a great Phyllis Diller impression. She's great. Um, I remember talking to her when I was going through my. One thing she respected about me was I always told her the truth about where I was coming from, from a religious point of view. And I love the fact that she, she never judged me. Now, uh, she doesn't agree with where my journey has taken me today and my journey could take me somewhere different 10 years from now when we do the reunion of this. Yeah. (laughs) But, um, I remember her 
saying one time that she also had similar questions that I had had or question marks in her journey of faith, but that she had spent so, I don't want to, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but she had, she was like, but I'm just going to have to make a choice to not pursue those questions anymore. Yeah. And, um, and, and I wondered why for so long, like, mom, what, wait a minute, let's research it together. Let's go to the library together. Like, <laughs> yay. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we can do this. Yeah, let's go to the library. Let's research it. Let's get the microfish out. Let's do it, man. But, um, but I remember reading, I'm a real big fan of Dr. Joe Dispenza. And um, he wrote this book, uh, Breaking the Habit of Yourself or Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Well, w- and when I started studying um, neuroscience, <laughs> that's a great topic. It's very interesting. Yeah, yeah it is. I started studying that. <laughs> you're like, wait. Are you a Sam Harris fan? Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I was big into yeah, Sam yeah. Harris. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, this is, these are like uh, this is not sympathetic laughs or humor. This is AI. I, I get. I, I but it's it. kind of weird that like all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, you're yeah. studying Shakespeare, and then you just say, <laughs> like, I'm certified. I'm certified in like neurolinguistic programming, like NLP and oh man, nice. and, yeah, and uh, wow. I, you know, I I love those kinds of things. I became so fascinated by. I that. love science technology. Uh, so it, it's I, absolutely. It's way better than any fiction you could ever read. Oh, a hundred percent. I love it. I used to be anti-science, but now I'm like, man, these people are pretty cool. Yeah. Well, so in studying um, or reading with uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza, he he talks about how the brain operates in a couple of things. But I, the reason I started looking at this was because. I had crazy uh, performance anxiety when I would perform as an actor. I would get incredibly nervous um, to the point that um, I used to have that too. Yeah, I, I just I would shake. Mm-hmm. I don't have that now. Yeah, but I wanted to know. Well, because remember that if if I have a student that says this is my dream, and then they say, "But I'm scared to death to go to set," then I want to help them figure out how we can conquer it. Right. Um, and so I started figuring out, like, well, how's the brain operating? And basically, I'm going to bastardize his entire book. Okay, guys? It's a New York Times bestseller, and I'm going to summarize it in 60 seconds. And go. Go. <laughs> basically, uh, the brain thinks two ways, okay? You're in survival or you're creative. Mm-hmm. And it's going to do one of those two channels. And you can't do both at the same time. So typically, if you were to play a tennis match and you're nervous at the beginning, after a few minutes, it's going to go away because your body settles. And now you can start seeing the ball a little bit. But you know, like t- at the beginning of a sports competition or a game, like, eh, get the pregame yeah, jitters. Fight yeah. or flight. Yeah. yeah, how, yeah. yeah so, so you're in surviving. Then you can become elite and world class when you transition your thought patterns into creative. And so in studying that, uh, basically the science suggests that when you are presented new information that goes against the core of your foundation, your background, your heritage, your belief, your environment, your brain instantly goes into survival mode. You're no longer creatively thinking, listening, feeling, open. Uh And when it goes into survival, it instantly starts to release chemicals that are going to keep you alive. The amygdala starts going crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And so now, instead of truly listening, you're like, where's the escape? Where's my point that I can win? When am I going to interject my conversation? Uh, How do I get this person to stop? How can I get them out of here? And it creates almost a painful chemical release in the brain. So it is painful to get new information that's contradictory to your uh, personal background or the way you were raised. Yeah. So it makes sense for people to not want to change. Right. It makes sense because I was like, how come when people come from other studios to train with me or if I would work with another tennis player back in the day and I would say, you know, I think actually the problem is this. Oh, it'd be like, it'd be like I told them their grandmother was a prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> She's They'd be a like, dirty what? slut. <laughs> you know what I mean? They would be like, what? This is crazy. And, but, I, but I remember feeling that same hot flash of like, someone just challenged my political belief? What? Yeah, uh, yeah. And I couldn't understand why. But I started thinking, oh, that's probably why is our, our, our brains, are, are, they're not open to change. They like habits. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's way safer to have a habit oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, than it is to try something new. And so um, anyway, I, I think that's why people, from a scientific point of view, 
want to stay where they are. They don't want to try new things. They don't want to learn new techniques. The, the best way is you've got to teach yourself every day to be flexible. I agree. Yeah. You know, I'm, that, I'm not suggesting go against your challenge, your morals every single day. I'm not suggesting that, but you know what I'm trying to yeah, say? I like, think it depends yeah. on the person because uh, we all, we all can handle different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think some people, they just can't handle challenging those core beliefs that they have. Yeah. Whereas yeah. me, I, I kind of, um, I've always been really curious my whole life. So for me, it's kind of a natural inclination to challenge my beliefs. Like, why do I believe this? Why do I feel this way? Why do I feel so strongly about this thing? Yeah. Am I right? Am I completely wrong about feeling this way? Like what, you know, what's causing me to be this way? And I, you know, I think a lot of who we are is, it may have to do with just genetics too. You know, I mm -hmm. think that's part of it. We, we all have different interests, maybe on mm -hmm. a genetic level. Um, but, uh, you know, when it, when it comes to like spiritual things and beliefs, I, you know, I kind of, I, I, at this point in my life, I feel like somehow we're all connected somehow, you know, yeah. we're, we're all like part of one thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we are data, then clearly we're all connected because then, then it's just all data. Right. Um, but I had this experience years ago, I think I shared it with you. Uh, I was with another business partner, we were traveling and, uh, and I'd been having a lot of these questions about my religious beliefs. And I was like, I, mm. you know what? I don't believe that anymore, but I'm not sure what I believe. Like, because there's got, I felt like there had to be something more on a spiritual mm. level than just nothingness, you know? Yeah. And uh, we were at the airport in Dallas and we had a layover. And my buddy's like, hey, man, look at these nuns. And I checked out these nuns. And they were like, they look like check nuns. Them out. Yeah, yeah. Hot? checking out yeah, these nuns. <laughs> Did you see any ankle? <laughs> <laughs> you could <Come> it. <laughs> no ankle at all. <laughs> but they had these these like <laughs> medieval looking robes, like these brown robes, oh, okay. like these big wooden crosses. I was like, this is like something off a movie set, you know. And and I was bored, so I went up and talked to them. And I just I wanted to ask them what type of nuns they were and where they were out of and stuff, <laughs> just being curious. And uh, I guess the head sister. <laughs> she's she's this, like <laughs> this. This taken out of context. If you just cut this out of the podcast and play it anywhere else, it no one knows what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, ask the head sister. <laughs> so she's like, <laughs> she said, uh, "Oh, we're you know we're, we're Franciscan nuns. Have you heard of Saint Francis?" Oh. And I was like, "No, I haven't." And uh, but you have. Yeah. And she's like, "Well, you know, uh, Saint Francis. He started the." Like St. Francis of Assisi? Yeah. Okay. He started the Holy Order of the Franciscans and all that stuff. And she's like, we have a little bit of a different belief system than the main Catholic Church, but we're still a part of the Catholic Church that. and all that. Okay. And um, Are they the part that messes with little boys or the other part? I'm not sure. I don't think they do. I think that's just... <laughs> They're the probably the part that doesn't. That's, but, you know, that's definitely a problem. Oh, I've, I've got some good bits about that. <laughs> but, but anyway... <clears throat> she um, she came back up to me. The late, she asked me to use my phone. She's like, uh, "Would you mind if I use your phone to to call our um, uh, what do they call them uh, convent?" And mm. uh, I think they were going to Mexico or something. And I was like, "Yeah, sure, call." And and uh, and she's and then she gave my phone back. She's like, "By the way, why did you ask about us?" She, and I was like, "No, I'm just curious. You know, just thought you had really cool looking mm -hmm. wardrobes. You know, so I just." wanted to find out, you know, what you were about. And she's like, well, that's really cool. She's like, you know, thank you for asking about us. No one ever talks to us, so that's really nice. And I was mm. like, well, yeah, sure. And I got on the plane later, Yeah. and I, I was reading um, uh, Sid Field's screenwriting book, the screenwriter's workbook, yeah. and I turned the page to the next page. This one I read, and it blew my mind. All right. I'm like, oh, shit, there's a lot more to this than, you know, what I can imagine. But this is what I read. I'm just going to read it. <clears throat> it says, Many years ago, while traveling with some friends in Italy, I went to visit l the little town of Assisi, the home of St. Francis of Assisi. And I was like, fuck! <laughs> Jeez, bro. What? You're in the Matrix. Yeah. yeah. And it said, We took a bus up a long and winding road to the little church and monastery high on the hill where St. Francis lived, worked, and studied. I didn't know too much about him. I knew he started the Holy Order of the Franciscans, and I knew he wrote sublime poetry, essays, and philosophy. The paintings and images I had seen had always shown him being surrounded by the birds and other animals. 
It was said that he could talk to the animals, and his poetry and writings are filled with the harmony and union of nature, and that all life is connected by divine consciousness. All living things are related, he said. The birds, the trees, the rocks, the rivers, the streams, the oceans, we are all manifestations of, of the one consciousness. And as living beings, we express the life force that flows through us. Call it God or nature or whatever you want. It doesn't matter. It is what it is. And I was like... <laughs> and I was just like, whoa. CeCe's got some great quotes. So I was like, well, that's, that's my, my God moment, you know. Yeah. And so it was like... It was like the universe Good saying, you, "Yeah, man. it's all connected." I'm glad you went up, but it was really and talked to them. Yeah, it was re- and very, asked an honest, open-ended question. It was a very cool experience. Can you tell me what you believe? Can you tell me who you are? Yeah, yeah. that's a deep question. Yeah. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> so, who are you? Anyway, that was that was a really weird experience, but sounds pretty yeah, pretty unique, pretty profound, and amazing. Though. Yeah, it was profound. Yeah. That's a much yeah. better word. So we were, uh, I'm going to come back to something you were saying a minute ago. Okay. So when I know somebody knows something really, really, really well, they can take that thing and, and work in and out of it. Like you were making the analogy, you're relating tennis to God, to religion, to, and acting. So <laughs> literally what that tells me about you is that you are vastly familiar with or just know to your core a lot about religion, a lot about acting, a lot about yeah. tennis. Yeah. And what I really love about that is... I think you have to be that to be able to be at the level that you want to be and to be able to instruct others to be at that level because you were talking earlier about sometimes people can't handle things, right? They get overwhelmed. Like they, they can't challenge themselves every day, maybe yeah. too much, right? Be, because of your mastery of those things, you can take someone from point A to point Z, if you will. Sure. Because you know where they're at in that process and you know how to, to challenge yeah. them in a way that doesn't overwhelm them too much that they quit. I hope I hope I do. Yeah, I would I would say it's, it was really hard. I was we had somebody come and kind of uh, check out our facility and wanting to in, invest in it. And, and they were like, could you write a book? Could you write a curriculum book from like if you taught someone on Saturday, they would learn this. And then on Monday you learn this. And that sounded really cool in theory. Mm-hmm. But. I didn't think I could write a school textbook. Like, could you write a textbook? I got approached to write a textbook for like high school drama classes, at, at, you know, in, in a high school, like a public high school. Like, what would they teach? But I, I, um, I could come up with something, but it didn't yeah. feel authentic to me in doing that. It didn't feel right because everybody learns differently. And because I think there are some aspects that uh, I don't really even need to teach certain actors. They're already born with it. Yeah. Like no one had to tell LeBron about athleticism. Yeah. Right. He kind of already had it. Now, so his training needed to be a little different. Same with Kobe. Yep. You know, and there's like different kinds of actors. I was talking about this in my last uh, virtual online session or whatever that I did where I stole some of these ideas from Stanislavski and then kind of... Uh, the father of (laughs) classical act and then like was like uh i think i'm gonna kind of expand on this a little bit but i think there's different types of performers and once i can identify the type of performer then i think that determines your training kind of like personal training if you were to work out with someone and someone is scared to leave their home um and they have fears of being in a gym or, or you meet someone and they're like, yeah, I used to work out all the time and I know about this. Or someone who's like, I'm really, I'm really great at understanding food, but I don't understand what each, you know, how I can build a, a, a regiment in the gym that can give me upper body strength or whatever. Like you right, would just yeah. cater it to them. And um, I think once I figure out the learning style of the actor and the kind of performer they innately are or what's in their DNA, right. Then you can kind of not to say fast track them because that sounds like they're not putting in the time or the effort, but yeah, fast track them. Yeah, like let me just yeah. take out. There's no need for us to. This is a basketball. Right. And LeBron's like I've been playing for like yo. I yeah. started shooting it when I was three. I'm yep. good. The basketball was Joe Naismith. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you're like uh, he didn't. He didn't need to know the history yeah. of the sport. Right. Those are certain things that you can accumulate on your own and just kind of figure out how to prioritize people's time. And yeah. Because I, I love understanding and I have a passion for education, I think 
um, and a passion for people. I love people, yeah. uh, man, and I value them. And, uh, and everybody has a story. They have something to say. Yeah. Uta Hagen used to say, don't be an actor unless you have something to say. And, um, you know, I mean, all of us have something very valuable that's happened in our lives that, that would make for a phenomenal screenplay, a wonderful biography about yeah. our lives. Yeah. And um, while some things might be insignificant to, you know, to uh, uh, one person, they're incredibly valuable to another. And, um, but all of us have a story worth hearing. Yeah. And that's the thing that I wish everybody could understand, especially during the, the conflicts that are happening right now. I just, everyone does have a story that needs to be heard somehow. And your story is incredibly valuable. And just because, you know, just because uh, I grew up a certain way or doesn't mean mine is less valuable than yours. We, your story is incredibly valuable and somebody probably needs to hear it. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's why I want people to succeed in the acting world is because it could save somebody. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's so, uh, you know, no, so, true, so, oh, yeah. like my grandmother being like, Drew, when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you're, when are you going to, when are you going to get a real job? Take care of your family, Drew. When are you going to do that? <laughs> um, I, we've seen some crazy lives change. Some people set free. Yeah. You know, anyway. Oh yeah. I think we do the same thing with business. We can, we can take someone through that business, the, all these processes yeah. and we can pick somebody out and we, cause we know it really, really well. You, you almost get, and you've done it across three things. We get tunnel vision. I can, anything business, whether it's acting or plumbing or mm -hmm. ATMs or whatever, I'm like, I mean, because uh, the the widget that we're selling, yeah, the, the service or... or Cogs the, and widgets. Yeah, maybe. man. <laughs> whatever that is can be is interchangeable, right? Those yeah. business concepts are the same. So we can take someone from, we can figure out where they're at in this process. And you were talking about, it's not about fast track as in they're not putting the hard work in. When I hear fast track, what I'm hearing you say is you can help them navigate and avoid other pitfalls and keep them sure. from getting distracted. You can, you That's can go a better down, way of saying, yeah, you keep can go, them from getting distracted. Yeah. I can, you're going to focus on the wrong thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yes, this has some, uh, bearing in the business world, but this is not important. This yeah. is not where you put your energy. Don't get distracted for five years. Like some people do going sure. down this to realize you should have been over here and you as a leader can kind of keep them focused, which in, which in turn fast tracks them because they're not all over the place. Yeah. We had an article in the newspaper the other day and they were, uh, the guy was like, how have you gotten these, essentially these kids became like quarter millionaires from our studio. And he was like, how did you do that? You know? And, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I know what we've done, right. but every one of them had a completely different, journey they didn't sell the same product right yeah. as an actor and um and it's funny we had like like one day uh i woke up and uh, my wife was like what's wrong and i was like i have 800 dms <laughs> <laughs> all of a sudden and one of our girls her tv show hit like number one on netflix Nice. And she put a little thing out on Instagram about it. And which which show is it? Outer Banks. Oh yeah, uh, one of the yeah. lead girls. Yeah, is people on that. Trans yeah. us at the studio, that's and cool. then Sweet Magnolias is number was number one. And that's a good show. The, by the, the way. lead high school girl is also at oh, from awesome. our studio. They both trained in the same class. So like Iron wow. Sharpens Iron. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 I like and Sweet Magnolia a lot with my wife. We watched that. I, I want to. There you go. I want to admit that on camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Little Annie, yeah. the high school girl, oh, Annie, yeah. Annalise Judge. She, so she lives here and she trained, she's been training with me for the last four years. And, um, and then Madison Bailey on, um, uh, Outer on Banks. the Outer Banks. Yeah. Cool. And so That's they awesome. both trained in this, started in the beginner programs and worked all their way up, but they were able to, we were able to identify like, Oh, they're incredibly conversational. They have great reading skills. They're very opinionated, which is good. You know, talk about making choices as an actor. When I say opinionated, I don't mean like attitude. Right. I'm yeah, saying yeah. they can look at something and, and the strength of the actor is how fast it takes you to make a choice and how honest that choice can be from your point of view. And um, they could do that. They could read something and say, I absolutely believe my character would not do this or my character would do this and here's why. And of course, 
we're guessing, guys. <laughs> we don't say guessing in the acting world. We call it making a choice, but it's an right. educated guess. Right, yeah. yeah. Sometimes and the director will say, make a different choice. Exactly. Yeah. But you, gotta, you have to actually make a choice. Right, yeah, it's got to be real. Not making a choice is far worse than making a bad then choice in bad the acting, acting. world. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, you can always correct. Yeah. I remember one guy that he was like, oh, what do I do in my rehearsal? And I was like, make a very clear choice strong in your rehearsal. Choice. Very strong, yeah. very clear. That way the director can instantly, you don't want them guessing like, are, are they flirting? Are they yeah. just friendly? Are they, huh, I don't, are they shy? Like it needs to be clear, yeah. which one are you? And then the, that saves the director a lot of time because they can just fix it in one, oh, they're not flirting. <laughs> they're not flirting they're authoritative okay and boom just do it like and it saves everybody time the faster you make a choice and the clearer it is yeah um but but those girls they were they were good at those things um and because of that they didn't need to spend but because their reading level was so high they didn't need to stay in a beginner program very long you know yeah and so you could just be like oh yeah okay <laughs> right you well, got a, it. That's a good. That's a really great example of what you talked about earlier. Is every person is different, and people have different strengths and weaknesses. I've seen actors come in for the first time, yeah, and just be super comfortable, mm -hmm. just really comfortable and organic and and real and you know and and so like that person, they need to just focus more on bigger choices, you know. Yeah, uh, I think David Mamet, uh, the great writer. And super opinionated, awesome guy. I love and can't stand him at the same time. So, <laughs> so polarizing. I love David Mamet. And, uh, but he was, he was quoting Stanislavski and he was like, yeah, you know, there's the, there's the performer that does this. There's a performer that does this. And then, then you have the prophet. He called, he called them a prophet. And the prophet is the person that was born to act and probably doesn't need formal training. They just need a set of practical skills. And you'll destroy them if you make them, you know, learn from the ground up. Yeah, yeah. You know, you just need to teach them like, oh, this is how you read a call sheet. This is how you respond. Like, you need to teach them practical skills. Yeah. And, um, you know, anyway. Well, I know, like, when I got started in acting, I had an issue with the nerve thing that you talked about. Mm. And, and then, you know, for a long time, it was it was a big distraction from the work. Mm -hmm, you know, it was mm -hmm. just, you feel so nervous, like you can't sure. think. Oh yeah. And you're, and you're constantly worried about, you know, the lines and all that stuff. And it's yeah. really not about any of that. It's just about being comfortable and then living in that moment, you know, knowing the idea of what you're doing, having good choices. Mm -hmm. And it took, you know, it took a lot of time to get to that point. And, uh, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm just now at a level now where I, I can, you know, sit in a piece of work and be really comfortable with it. And yeah, and um i am too but yeah i think i can handle it now yeah but man I've, I've i used to be a train wreck dude i remember the first time we went on you know got on a set and i was like just freak, I freaked out you mm -hmm. know i was like man i don't know if i should be here i don't know if i'm ready for this what was your first time on set do you recall uh well the first time would have been a commercial like a okay. local commercial or something and i yeah. was not too nervous for that um yeah when was the first when was the time you actually remember yourself being nervous on set I don't even remember. Um, probably, probably like an indie thing. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, it was like an indie. It was like a student film, mm -hmm. and I'd only been acting for a few months. Yeah, and uh, I just remember like I had worked on the material before the thing and before the shoot, and then when I got there, I just felt just super nervous. Yeah, and then I only had a couple lines. Sometimes, but it was less like it was almost harder. impossible to get. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I just I kept you know messing up. Yeah, because I just, I just felt like I was just reciting the lines. Yeah, and <sighs> instead of like living in that, and you can hear yourself. Oh, it was horrible, man! Words. It was awful. Oh. Yeah, because yeah, you're just thinking about it. Yeah. Instead of man, I just doing it. I know that feeling. Uh, but now it's like now I can go through you know five pages of dialogue and put it on tape tomorrow. Yeah. It's, it's funny how that muscle strengthens itself over yeah. time, and I, it, yeah. And it's not it's not like you're memorizing it either. I mean, you are, yeah. but it's it's like you're learning the idea. Yeah, like I was gonna say, you familiarize yourself with the content. Yeah. You know, I work with the TEDx speakers, 
So I do their private coaching. They come to the studio. They have a partnership oh, cool. with us. Wow. So, so I get to work with these really great thinkers and have these really cool ideas. And memorization is the uh, thing that holds everybody up. That's the thing we, we typically, they're required to work with me like three times before they get on the stage to present and we record it. And that's typically the thing is, how am I going to remember this? And, it, and they always look at me like I'm an idiot when I say, well, why don't you just talk about what? Just improv it, yeah. What do you talk about what you know about? Right. You're the doctor. Just tell us, you got the slide right there. Right. Just, yeah. can you tell me what's on the slide? And that baffles. They look at me, like I'm telling you, they look at me like I'm an idiot half the time. And they're like, you're not helping. And so we had to figure out like other memorization techniques for yeah. presenting and, and public and stuff like that. My favorite is somatic memorization technique. That's my favorite memorization technique. And that's what I use to get How over my fear. How does that work? Fear. What do you do? Well, I paid for the workshop. To learn how to do it. <laughs> Official. Basically, here's what it is. I, I, because I, I don't know if that company would want me to tell them their thing. So, right, yeah. so basically, <laughs> you can buy it online. Version. Um, yeah. yeah, you can participate in the workshop. Um, essentially, you familiarize and you work the copy so much in so many different ways using a set of patterns um, that you start to put it in the recesses of your brain. I mean, you try oh, to, okay. That's essentially you yeah. get so familiar with it that, um, through a pattern of repetition that, and, um, non-associative multitasking. So like we would toss a football as we're practicing. I do something similar to that too. When I work on, you know, so like, yeah. Trying to convince your brain to make the talking second nature yeah. instead of Makes first it conversational. Nature. Yeah. Yes. And um, there's a lot of other things to it. That is absolutely yeah, yeah, not totally, the yeah. process. <laughs> there's a lot of other scientific and tricks and things like that. But, uh, um, but that helps a lot. But, but that is a thing of like um, getting, getting yourself to a point where material is yours. That's the whole purpose of acting training is so you don't get caught lying. Right. We're saying somebody else's words. Yeah. And the reason we go to these incredible extremes is because the brain knows we're lying. Yeah. It's going to reject it all the time. If it's not real, then people pick up on it. They're oh, mirror 100%. neurons. We know when we're... Because as if it's good work, people are hooked up. They're hooked yeah. up to you. Yeah. Like they're linked to you, literally. Yes. Like their, their brain is producing similar brain waves to the person in the situation. Yeah, you just got to... Yeah, that's the big trick. So when I say like these girls are really good at being conversational... They were able, they were so good at reading and reading comprehension that they could just get a script and know, all right, it's no longer here. It's back here. And then they could put their energy on just listening and they would just react to naturally what you were doing. They weren't trying to like, I call it red light, green light acting is when you're like, okay, my turn. And oh, oh, now yeah. your turn to talk. And oh, my turn to talk. And now your turn. Remember <laughs> that kid's game, like red head. light, oh, green yeah. light? You're like, red light, yeah. ah, green light. <laughs> ah, go to the back of the line. Yeah. But that's how, that's how most people try to act. And um, anyway. So. Well, uh, what you were saying about how you um, work out your material, like, well, I'll do something similar. I'll go through, um, well, at first, I'll just read the script. Smart. You got to be a, a detective. You got to yeah. figure out what's Just happening. See what the character's about, and then, and then I'll I'll improv it a few times. Just mm -hmm. what what I think that is happening in that scene or those scenes. Nice. And then I'll go back and then I'll just work on each idea individually. Yeah. And I'll I'll get comfortable as soon as I'm comfortable with the first idea. I move on to the, the next idea, and then then connect them, and then keep Smart. going through it. And you know that takes half an hour or so, mm -hmm. maybe an hour. And then once I've done that, then I'll start doing, I'll start working out the, the scene. I'll, I'll make some choices, start working out yeah. the scene and the material and doing something else while I'm mm. doing it. Like I'll, I'll Smart. find an activity. Non-associative multitasking. Yeah, because then it's, it starts becoming natural. It's like yeah. you're putting it in the autonomous part of your brain. That's 100% yeah. what I should have said. And I didn't think <laughs> of how to say that. <laughs> but that's that's yeah. that's how I'd go through it. That's um, yeah, that's it, it seems to work pretty well. And then you could still get hung up though sometimes. But you can. But it's not as likely. I had to learn to trust the process when I went to set. Yeah. I was so nervous 
about forgetting lines because my brain says that's the one thing they're judging you on and right. it's not. Yeah. But it took me a while to let go of that and, until I got on set enough times where I saw how many people don't know their lines. Oh, it's crazy, yeah, especially I like big actors. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And in their defense, they have far more copy than a lot. than we do. And sometimes they'll get a whole new scene like oh, that day. Dude. You know? Hey, this <laughs> This, uh, the last feature film that I shot at the beginning of the year, um, which will come out maybe beginning of next year. Can you say what it is? Or I don't know. I, Not yet. I signed yeah. a thing. Oh, yeah. no, it's, <laughs> they yeah. won't let me say. I, yeah, I could. <laughs> don't, don't, though. I don't know if I'm supposed <laughs> yeah, don't. to. You're, I better you're, not. It's okay. physically possible. You're just not. It was for MGM. Let's just put it that way. Okay, there you cool. go. Okay. So, and it was a big thing. It was so big, and I was so unimportant. They did not give me the script. We used dummy sides, fake sides, like fake scenes. Yeah, yeah. So you audition for, with fake material. I've done that before, yeah. Yeah. So we used dummy sides, and I had like, it was like a three or four round audition. I'd keep going back and forth to Atlanta, things like that, to try it out. It just with fake sides. I was supposed to start on a Monday shooting at Screen Gym Studios in Atlanta. Sunday, I still didn't have the script. Oh. So I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and that was the, now I'm cool with that now. That's a overwhelming, yeah. And so uh, the, the network sent the non-disclosure and all these electronic scans, the face picture for me to get, this. I had to do all this stuff, security, to get the script. And then I saw the script and was like, okay, well, thank goodness I don't have but so much to say. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. we were all freaking out. <clears throat> Only the top four bills, uh, the top four leads, uh, had um, the script. That's and so really unusual, though. They did a table read, but none of us, I guess, kind of code day players that show up for a day yeah, or yeah. two and shoot it, none of us were privy to it. And so I remember on the, they picked us up at, uh, uh, at base camp, and then they were going to caravan us uh, – uh, to set yep. and the guys we were all like hey how's it going and oh good good hey did you by any chance get a script They're like no i didn't get a script i just got it this morning at 3 a.m and like, dude me too like and then the dude in the back would be like i haven't seen what we're doing either and like it was all of us guys <laughs> going to set scared to death Blind. knowing like we don't know what we're about to do it's crazy yeah. and people don't get that that's why training for tv and film i think is very serious unlike theater where I'm gonna, we're gonna flesh it out over a period of rehearsal times, and yeah. we're really gonna get it on its feet really well. You have to be prepared for a little bit of that that stress uh, level, that high performance, you know, anxiety level. You got to be prepared for that in film and TV. That's what a lot of people are not prepared for. Well, that's true, yeah, because you don't have like, I mean, you may get one rehearsal. Oh yeah, and with that's digital, it. I mean, if we're not shooting on regular rolls of film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, guys, let's just shoot the rehearsal. You know, I remember I was working with um, uh, Dana Gould was producing the TV show. John C. McGinley. Okay, I don't know if you remember him as on Scrubs. I think he was in Platoon. You would know him I'm if sure you saw I know him. It. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. I know him. So. Okay. And uh, I remember getting there, and they were like, hey, John's kind of ready to go in and shoot, so we're going to go in and do it. And I was, okay, no rehearsals, nothing. Yeah. Okay. So I get my role. Did you even talk to the guy first? No, we get, yeah. we get on just, set. We're ready to shoot. <laughs> they just throw you in. And the scene was, the scene was, I'm a priest who's also a demon. <laughs> Spoiler <laughs> alert. Hey. I'm killing parishioners. What, what movie is this? Or it was a series? TV show. It was on IFC and it was called Stan Against Evil. Okay. It's kind of a comedy yeah. um, and uh, dark horror comedy, right? It only lasted like a couple seasons and I was on the first season. And so, um, and so I got to play this priest who was killing everybody. I was like the guest star of that That's episode. Cool role. And so I go behind the door. There's the big church red door shooting at an actual church somewhere in, in Atlanta. He opens the door real quick and says, hey, Johnny C., good to meet you. Let's get started. Boom, slams the door in my face. <laughs> and they were like, all right, let's do it. And I butchered those lines. I was so like, uh, um, okay, because like, I don't know how he's going to say it. I don't know what's happening. And he, he improvised a little bit, so... Thankfully, I love improv. And I think I, that first take, I got maybe like 45% of the lines. Because I was just so, like, uh, um, yeah, so. 
Okay, like, you know how, like, right before you film with me or something like that, you'll be like, hey, can you give me a minute? Yeah. There was no, like, None of that. there was no, like, give me 30 <laughs> seconds. It, it was, I didn't even have 30 seconds. That's crazy. And then they closed the door and they were like, that's pretty good. Let's do it again. And right, take two. Ready? Here we go. And, you know, <laughs> and then I made sure I was done. I was done filming maybe like eight minutes later. That's crazy. Yeah. They paid all that money for me to be done in eight minutes. Yeah. It was crazy. But, and then I've had stuff where like when I was shooting the movie, because all of us were new with our material, it, we went overtime for three days in a row because we all kept, you know, yeah. it was a scene with like 12 people in it. Oh, and wow. We all had something to say. Uh, that's great. So that's... We, it took us, so I got paid like tremendous overtime. Just awesome. the writing for that is <laughs> really complex. Yeah. We had a really cool writer, a very famous writer was working that's on awesome. it, which was kind of cool. And, um, Anyway, hopefully those scenes stay in the movie. Yeah, that's another <laughs> yeah, thing that's too. That's the other yeah. thing is I I've had stuff cut out, that. and I was like, "Oh, that was really fun to work on." And now it's gone; like it's completely cut. Do you still get credit for that? Like, does it still show up even if they didn't use your material or no? No. Uh, yeah, it depends. <laughs> you can uh, get you can get uncredited on IMDb. Um, it de- it depends. If it's a SAG thing, usually they'll give you credit for sometimes, it. Sometimes, yeah, or sometimes you can get in the special if, thanks. If it's, if it's non-union, they oh, probably special thanks, you. yeah. Oh yeah. Sometimes you can get that. Sometimes it's in deleted scenes, um, and but a couple of times, I've been cut from maybe like three or four things, and I did not get credit. That was not in the uh, credits for it. Yeah. Um, I, I did I did a um, pretty big scene on Legends and Lies. Mm. They got cut out. Oh, it was a really man. cool scene too. God. Um, but no, oh well, nobody gets, see, I don't even tell people when I'm like what I'm in or what I, yeah, I you just do never know. because yeah. I've been humiliated in the past, but <laughs> guys, everybody's there to watch your viewing party. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe it was next week. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I did a viewing party for the very first TV show I was on. Got cut out of it. And, uh. Uh, it was at my sister's house. We're all excited and, uh, I've never done it. Never done it since. Yeah. So I've gotten cut out of a couple of things. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's very disappointing. I th- you know, I had somebody tell me that you can still keep it on your resume. You can. Because yeah. it was still a booking. It was still a job you, still you got. Did it. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially uh, something that's notable. Yeah. yeah. Um, when he was on, uh, was it NCIS New Orleans? Yeah. Remember that? I was hey, like, I cut your footage for that. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, yeah. But you were actually on it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was like, I was like, all right, Neil's gonna be on this. All right, I gotta, I gotta. I was like, had my phone ready. I'm gonna record the TV. Yeah. <laughs> not the whole thing, just like Neil's part, you know. Sure. <laughs> yeah, just gotta send it to some people. Like, hey, Neil's on. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool, man. Yeah, yeah, it, it was, was. A good, good game. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was. Cool. And the village. Yeah. yeah, that was. That was really cool. That was good too. It got canceled, but. So did Bluff <laughs> City Law. My my TV show got canceled. Oh. Yeah, I saw saw that like yesterday or the day before that that we got canceled. So. How many credits do you have now? You've got 53? 50 something. 50 something, yeah. But probably only 30 would be considered, you know, recognizable. Ah, They're all good, though. They're it's all not even worth good. getting out of bed if you don't have at least you know, 70, I think, right? You're probably right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're probably right. Hey, you know what? It's what is, what is considered good is, is so varying. Like, I remember it's ambiguous. when people were like, well, when I get three credits, I'll start my IMDb page. And then I remember getting three and then seeing the dude with 12 and being like, oh, man, I guess I'm not cool. But when, you know, and then, and then getting 12 and was like, this dude has 22. Yeah. yeah. All right. And it's never ending. It's a vicious. Yeah. I'm going to start one to make you feel better with zero. All right. I got confidence for days. Hey, man. If I see that, then I'm going to be like, hey, do you want me to help you get some? Yeah. Oh, I'm I run down. this acting I'm studio. I'd love yeah. to help you. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't tempt me. I like, like doing new things. I, uh, I'm, I'm going to be sure. perfect in a film for something. I'm not exactly sure what. but You absolutely would yeah. be. Oh, yeah, Put me sure. next to like some itty-bitty person. Put me? me next to Tom Cruise or you. Me. Yeah. Tom and I are the same size. Yeah, there sure, you yeah. go. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, like, I, I can be like this... Uh, Super intelligent villain. What do you think about that? I like that idea. I love Just it. Just casting myself as an intelligent person. Also, <laughs> potential Quaker. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Definitely. We're doing an uh, we're doing Amish yeah uh, movie there. A little oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I used to I used to get that. I can we can get it out. How there long right. you been growing that beard? That's what I want to know. Uh, it's been trimmed a few times, unfortunately. Okay. But uh, I've had a beard, no no bullshit, since I was like thirteen. I love uh, that. But it just doesn't look as you know as seasoned as this. But uh, um, there oh, are see, probably I wish I, mine's too patchy. I wish I could grow it for real, uh, dude. You know, it's because you it's like twenty eight. If you shaved, I think you'd probably be like eighteen. <laughs> That's the yeah. problem. Yeah, my with one of my, crow's feet. I'm yeah. eighteen with crow's feet. <laughs> My uh, one of my brothers has a really patchy. It's really funny, actually. Still, but um, <laughs> I don't know, man. It's just weird. It's just always been people. When I was I was really skinny, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, at one point in my life, and uh, I got the Abe Lincoln thing. Like they they thought I had like the Abe beard because uh, it was just like the thin handlebarish, uh, you know, esque kind of look. But uh, some version of a beard for I, I've had like twice in my life that I've shaved it, um, and and had to keep it clean shaven. I was miserable. <laughs> I I like where I am now. My yeah. wife appre- my wife loves a beard though. Yeah, yeah. She'd good. probably uh, she'd be crushing on you hardcore. I gotta uh, watch out. Yeah, fair enough, fair Don't enough. come around my wife, bro. See, and I'm confident too, man. You gotta be careful. Oh no. Yeah, I know, and man. And you're tall. Yeah. God. And this right here, ask my wife. Comfort. I'm telling you, man, like I'm super like she gets right on this shoulder and just curls up on me. I'm like a big teddy bear. I keep her warm. How long have you been married? Oh, man, we've been together August to be 16 years married, and uh, February 27th was 18 years to get dating. That's awesome. August 27th is Congrats, 16 man. years married. Yeah, You're a been, statistical anomaly. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> I'm telling you. Knock on wood. So, But uh, we got together when we were 17, so awesome. we're uh, completely different people than where we were then. Well, and we've as, actually well, you should, yeah. probably changed. I think we've been through, like, at least me. I've been a different person now, I think, three times. Like, literally, I'm just... I think I was always the same guy, but at 17, I probably acted like I was, like, 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. Um, That's probably pretty (laughs) accurate. And then probably by, like, 25, I was acting like I was 17. And then... Yeah. 30, I felt like an 18-year-old. You know, I felt like an adult at 30. Like, okay, now I'm an adult. Now I'm 30. Some of this dumb shit I gotta quit doing. And 35, I'm finally... Like, in the last few years, I feel... Like, okay, I can... I'm, I've, I've been varying levels of success the entire time since yeah. I, I mean, I was going to, I knew I was gonna be an entrepreneur, a business person at 13, but damn it, all those chemicals, all that stuff going on has finally quieted. And it's like, I can focus, I can think, I can process, I can be methodical about things. That's only happened. Like it's going to happen when you hit 50, you'll yeah. have the uh, midlife, the midlife crisis oh, is really the brain giving you another opportunity to Dude, evolve. Right. I'm all about yeah. like Warren Buffett is, uh, I don't, I'm going to butcher this. I think he's 89 now, but I'm inspired by that. Like he's my old f- enough to be our grandpa. Yeah, man. My, my grandfather Probably worked. Great grandfather. <laughs> my, everybody's like, well, we're going to retire. You're going to do this. I, I don't even, I don't believe in that. I think that's a I waste. Either. You need to have some project, yes. some yeah. passion, Retiring some thing bad. you're doing. And he's like, um, I'll retire when I'm dead. Right? I like that a lot. Same. I want something, a project to work on. And it's like, so 50 just means that maybe if I'm lucky, maybe I'm just halfway th- to the big projects. Like he's 80. Yeah. Warren's 89. He's still making power moves. He's still out there getting it. He's still influential. And I, I hate to yeah. use him solely as an example, but I really admire that. It's like just, you know, if you're 40, you're 50, you're 60. Guess what? It, all that means is you've got a, high, a potentially a stronger knowledge base yeah and a and a higher point of elevation than your competition like that's all that yes. means to me yeah as long as your brain's still functional yeah the retirement that's was it. the worst thing my father ever did it's a terrible idea and it i you know i saw that so i 100 yeah. percent applaud that i'm my, i don't want to retire my father um retired he got a military when he was 17. Mm. They, uh, my mother and him had me very young thank him for our service Def- uh, i'll service. definitely tell him um and uh, obviously he re- he only retired from the military because he had uh, become essentially become an entrepreneur and start another career so now he's like at a point where he's probably one of the hardest working people i know period Mm -hmm. as far as like physically mentally like he just every day he's missed one sunday a 12-hour day one sunday maybe two sundays in the last three years wow i mean like this dude works work ethic probably comes from the military i'm not sure (laughs) <laughs> yeah. But, you know, and he's, I would consider like in what other people would consider like us, you know, when they get to that point where they can retire from two jobs, mm-hmm. yeah. he's like to that point and on the third and he's just, <laughs> you know, I love that. Yeah. It's been, it's awesome to have that in my life. And that's kind of like how I am. I feel like, I feel like thankful that I'm these, whatever's been going on up here, the chemicals have let me calm down enough mm-hmm. to yeah. enjoy the process. Amen. Yeah. 
And I misspoke. I said thank him for our service, and I meant thank him for his service. Yeah. <laughs> I, I haven't definitely. done anything. Yeah, me neither. I haven't really. done anything worthwhile. All, all I did was live on the military base with him. <laughs> that's well, that's a, that's a phenomenal experience. <laughs> Let me ask you guys this. What makes you um, – what gets the uh, blood pumping when it comes to entrepreneurship and, and small business or business in general? What inspires you each day? Like, What gets you hyped up about things? Uh, I think um, – Daniel said it started at a young age. I think uh, I've always had an entrepreneurial spirit. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I remember being you know, five or six years old, drawing, like making drawings and then putting yeah. a price on them, trying to sell them to family oh, members. Oh, cool. You know, so I, I've always had that artistic side too, that creative side, but I've also always had the desire to create things and, and um, I guess, to be self-sufficient, I guess. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. Um, I had I had an uncle, or I have an uncle, who was very successful, and um, uh, he had a really successful drywall company. He did some real estate and stuff like that. And I would see him once a week at my grandmother's house when I was a kid, and he would always like plant these entrepreneurial seeds. Like, yeah. you know, if you want to be really successful, you need to work for yourself. You know, be your own boss, have your own business. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I can remember that as as far back as I can remember and um, so like he said you know around 13 I really knew eventually I was going to be my own boss I was going to have my own business and um, then I started my first company at 20 it was a flooring company with a friend of mine and um, I've had 20 some companies since wow um, god I'm so behind so but it's just <laughs> you know it's just it's the same thing that you were talking about though with um, the stuff you've done it's, it's the same mentality you yeah. know being an actor you're still self-employed so you're yeah. it's just that desire to create just to keep creating uh, whether it's business related or if it's, if it's art mm-hmm. um, I just have to be creating something and uh, maybe it's a little insanity <laughs> you know but uh, you need a little bit <laughs> yeah but it's that's what it is it's just to have this innate desire to create things um, yeah and grow things and that's to me, that's real pleasurable. It's really pleasurable to start a project and watch it come to fruition and, and turn into something. Mowing the grass. Not that. <laughs> but I'm saying, <laughs> that whole mowing the grass thing is like, I don't necessarily know if I like mowing the grass, but I love watching what it looks like it's when you're done. Yeah, when it's the, re- the reward of that. What about you? I man? love watching my uh, landscaper mow the grass. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, all right. I'm still doing the electric push mower. Because I'm um, environmentally conscious. Uh, so I think uh, one of the jokes I say is I like solving problems like people like Coke, you know, <laughs> like a drug addict likes Coke, you know. Oh, we're going that Coke. Yeah. 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 yeah like, like, <laughs> so I'm attracted to a problem. And so, but really what it is, we had a meeting last night, a business meeting in Charlotte, and there was a, sm- a small problem, right? The problem is everybody thinks the word problem has this negative connotation, this challenge to overcome. Yeah. The challenge is, is, hey, I've got this car with 200,000 miles on it. I've loved it. Uh, you know, it's been great for my family. My needs have changed. And the process of buying a new car is daunting, and I don't know where to begin, right? And, and I don't want to get ripped off, right? I hear problem. I know the solution. I have the background. Here's this process. Let me hold your hand through it, and I can save you money to boot. And this is, this is what we can expect. I get off on that. Like that, for me... I like how you said this is what we can expect. Like... The expectation, you know, you're, exactly. you have expectations for yourself, what exactly. you can do for other people. Exactly. And I set the expectation and be clear up front. And it's kind of an under promise over deliver. Um, and, and over time, yeah. I've honed in on this. But it, really what I'm doing is I want to be wildly successful. And because I want to be wildly successful, I understand that one of the ways to do that is to help enough other people solve problems. Oh, right. Very and, good. and it's like so if you look back at 13 at, at, at any age, like. I'd hear a problem, I'd hear a challenge, I'd hear somebody say we couldn't do something, and my brain would immediately be like, actually, I think we can, and this is what we need to do, right? Mm. And it's just been like doing that over a long period of time, and that's it. Like, if you said, hey, I want to accomplish this, like, okay, you're you're an amazing actor, right? You can still have challenges and things you want to overcome, and I like to help problem solve. I like to figure it out, and I get rewarded for doing that financially, which is great, and maybe in the beginning that was his sole purpose. Maybe that was the thing that drove me was the carrot. 
But now it's a little different. Yeah, I was to say, but obviously yeah. that doesn't sustain over time. No, because it's like that's why being a tennis pro over a long time oh, it man. didn't sustain me either. Yeah. I, I like all types of things, and and we Neil and I will just literally we're we're just bouncing ideas, right? And so time changes. What what works today may not work in ten years or five years or twenty yeah. years. Yes. So you have to like re- literally be able to look at what's going on. And we actually talked about this last night. What if we were late to the party? What if we missed this shift in society and we were six months late? Like for whatever reason, I was asleep and I just didn't see it happening. And I woke up and the world has changed. Mm. Mm-hmm. What is six months across a hundred years? What's six months across a lifetime? Right. Like you just have to be able to go. Okay, wait. Something has changed. Analyze the situation, make adjustments in what you're doing, mm-hmm. and then and then it's capitalism. I'm going to go out and openly compete, right? And what are what is that? You're a service or a product. You're still solving a problem. Yeah. My back hurts. I'm going to a chiropractor, a masseuse, right? The tennis shoes keep wearing out, and I need a, a stronger, right? Like it's 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 product mm-hmm. or service, yeah. predominantly. But what yeah. you're really doing is you're solving a problem. If there's not a need, you don't have a client, which means yeah. you don't have a business. So true. So it's like, for me, it's, it's all these things coming in. I just like to ident- identify people that have challenges they can overcome, and I see potential. Yeah. And I like to partner with them, and, and it's self-serving. No, see, that's another good word, partner. Yeah. You're a teammate. That's right. Hmm. See, I love that. I, I love being on a team. Yeah. Well, that's how society advances. It's yeah. the sharing of knowledge. Yeah. It's the only yeah. way. Um, Otherwise, we, would, we wouldn't accomplish anything individually. No. Yeah. It's impossible. And, <sighs> You know, but I'm also delivering a lot. We deliver. I'm very direct. I'm, if 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 you if you and I had a series of people, I'm gonna say, look, you know, these are things. I'm gonna set an expectation, but I'm also gonna hold somebody accountable. So Ronald Reagan used to say, trust but verify. So mm-hmm. I need to trust in this process. I have to verify that it's working, right? We had to we have to check check back in. Like I've got employees that they they don't particularly like it, mm-hmm. but I hold them to a very high standard, right? I mean, literally, I expect a lot, and I think all of them will agree with that. In return, I give a lot. Oh, like you were yeah. talking about with JD. Yeah. At the Actors Lab, you know? Expect yeah. a lot and get a lot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or, and it kind of takes care of itself. You it know? does. And when I, was, when I was younger, I used to struggle with being too direct. Like I was, mm. I've, I've calmed down a lot as I've gotten older. And also losing my leg calmed <laughs> me down a lot too. But I used to be very direct. Like, and, and people would take it as me being mean or an asshole or something. Mm-hmm. But I, mm-hmm. I didn't mean it that way. I was just really direct. Yeah. If if I saw an issue that needed to be fixed, I would just go straight at it. You know, yeah. or if I had an issue with an employee or or a manager or something, yeah. I would just go straight at them and tell them what I wanted changed. Yeah. And maybe not say it in the nicest way, just not not to mean. I mean, to me, sure. it wasn't mean. It was just direct. Yeah. They haven't. They're not used to that. But uh, you know. Well, I, and that was the thing that I had to. That was why my tennis director was like. Drew, 10 seconds, because I was so scared of offending someone right. that I never really got to the point of like, you got to pick your feet up and move a little faster. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, but yeah, I didn't have to be like, example, hey, yeah. dickhole, you got to move your feet. <laughs> yeah. And I, but I, I, you know, I kept going back and forth of like, I, I never found that perfect tightrope until yeah. I hit maybe mid yeah. 30s. Like, so I, I would like, just be like, oh. I'd be like, hey, this needs to be done this way. Like, I told you not to do it this way. And you're still doing it that way. It needs to be changed now. Yeah. And they're just like, I hate oh, you. I wish I would have had the <laughs> guts to like, talk like that. And, and I'm somewhere, <laughs> I'm somewhere between that and what I like to do is try to, especially people I care about. I give them, and, and Neil does this now too as well. Yeah. I give them more time. I'm like, look, this is the process. This is why we do it this way, and this is the the outcome that we expect. And the way that you're doing it doesn't put us here. Or it does, but it puts us here three days later, right? And I try to explain, like, why am I asking? You've got a guy, let's say, that's highly specialized, right? He can't helicopter up and get a bird's eye view of what's going on because he's highly specialized and focused on the one task he has. Mm -hmm. Everyone else he doesn't see as part of his process, he sees as a competing interest or Mm. a distraction, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I have to try to get him to understand that that everyone feels the same way about their task they're doing as you do, but it requires us to be cohesive and to work together. And for me to be a good leader, I've got to be able to helicopter up and, and make sure that all the moving parts are functioning well together. you're preaching to me yeah. right now. I'm listening. Yeah. All right. I need right? To and so that. I try to teach them that a little bit uh, and kind of flip it back on them a little bit. And, and to me, it's an education process because, again, mm-hmm. self-servingly, 
the stronger my teammates are, my partners are, this is that the whole, you're only strong as the weakest link in the chain, sure, right? Right. But the strong, the stronger my team is, the stronger I am, right? And, and so it's, it's an education process. And we've made a lot of employees partners. We've made, I mean, like literally we've, we've helped people buy cars. I mean, like, again, it's all about solving. I want their life to improve. Yeah. And I want them. Yeah, to, you're adding value. Yeah. I want them to trust that I want the world, right? And I'm willing to sacrifice. I don't care if it's your birthday. I don't care if it's your mom's birthday. I don't care if it's Christmas Day. I don't care what reason you think you shouldn't have to show up today. It's irrelevant because when opportunity presents itself, you have to show up. And if you're willing to do that, you can accomplish great things. Mm -hmm. And over time, and you get yourself into a position, you can then at that point choose which things you are and aren't going to do. And usually that's through delegation to someone else. Yes, but you so. can't do that and be at the start of your journey. Yeah. At the start oh, of your journey. Th yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And, <laughs> uh, you know, as I grew and evolved, I learned these things too. And I, I, I changed my approach to people. And, and it, it was more, you know, I, I started looking at employees or, or trying to encourage employees to take more responsibility for what they do. Mm -hmm. You know, like, look at this as your responsibility. This is, this is your business. You know, this is your thing, or right. especially with managers, you know, you, you want them to take ownership over what they're doing. Yeah. And then I, you know, I tell them like, Hey, if you do really well, if, if you do take ownership of this, this business and you do well and, and it, you know, your, your work produces, then you'll be rewarded. You know, you'll, you know, yeah. you'll be taken care of. And that's, I think, because it's the team thing, it's, right. it's making people realize that they are they're they're an essential part of the team of this yeah. team now sometimes you have people that will never be a part of the team right well, they're just not team players or they just don't you know maybe they're just some people are just lazy you yeah. know but you know you have some yeah. people that stand out and they'll go to that level you know they'll and those are the ones that you know you you, you reward yeah and some people want they think they want something the idea of what they think they want right they, they like the idea of it but not only are they not willing to go through the process to get it, it becomes like a you versus them thing. Right. So here's the problem. And I'm open to change and I'm, I'm, we partner and or advise people that have different expertise than we do. Yeah. And that's great. I love that. So I'm learning from them. But if you want to come in and do it our way, the way that we know how to do it, right. You have to kind of buy into the process at some point. Well, what happens is sometimes they're unwilling to buy into the process. They're unwilling to sacrifice, put the work in. The first time they have to make a difficult choice, wife or girlfriend, mother, family member, et cetera, is upset because they've made this plan and you can't get there because X has popped up. Mm -hmm. Something popped up. Yeah. You're up. They're I upset with you, <laughs> right? They're arguing with you. They're, they're, there's this, they're, now there's this trauma in your life. There's this stressor going on. Now is your first time you've been challenged because... At all their points, you had planned to go to work, and you showed up, and you did what you're supposed to do, but now you've got this friction. Mm -hmm. The choice you make and then continue to make starts to determine how successful you can be at that thing. And some people don't buy in the process. Well, then it flips. It becomes, well, I'm not successful because of you, right? Like, so someone else blaming me mm. for their lack of willingness to go through the process. And I say, listen, I understand. Yep. I, I think you have the potential to be wildly successful. The way I only know the way that we know how to do it. This this works, and I've made I've helped other people become millionaires. Yeah. I can tell you how to make ten grand a week because I've done it. I can tell you how to make fifty grand a week because I've done it. I can Teach tell you me. How to make, I want to know that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but I can tell you how to get to the point that I've attained, and beyond that, I can tell you how to make a hundred grand a week. Can I tell you how to make a million a week? No, because I haven't done it. So, I, I, so yeah. I'm gonna I can help advise you until what point you pass me, and then at that point we need to work together it's to find someone says. else. Yeah. You help people get where you want to be. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, but they don't, the problem is, is they come into our world, they partially buy in and they go home to their wife, kids, family, et cetera, yeah. external forces. And those people advising them, and I'm not dog, this is, this is. I know what you're going to yeah. say. They have nothing but a, a loving interest to That's protect right. the emotions That's right. of the employee or the leader or the manager. Yeah. The executive. However, that is coming from a, an emotional love. That's why people tell our actors don't become an actor, <laughs> you know, Yeah. because Hollywood's going to destroy you. And they're, it's really out of uh, a protection. It is. Um, it's nothing personal. So I know it's nothing personal. No, it's not. And I, and I don't take but it But it is way. sometimes 
um, what my wife would call it, um, split energy. You're starting to create, you're dividing the house That's in right. the very middle. That's right. And that is, that actually creates a horrible foundation for growth. Well, let me ask you this too. What if your father, your mother, what if your family, the people you cared about mm -hmm. told you that, you know, if you can uh, own a home when you get older and you can make, man, if you could make 70 or $80,000 a year or a hundred grand, oh my God, a hundred grand a year. It's the right? dream. It's the dream, right? They've yeah. set this box that they right. have. Cause that's the box in my family. Set. Yeah. They trapped you in, yeah. they put you in this box. The moment that you start to take and peel back the box and kind of step up outside of that, it, you have now messed with their comfort zone. Mm. And as you do that, if I tell someone from day one that they can make $10,000 a week and they don't think they can make 10 grand every six months or their family doesn't, they think I'm lying to them, right? Yeah. Their family thinks I'm lying to them. Their people think I'm lying to them. And for me, it's just math. This is not anything special. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you want to make a million bucks a year and you people would say, that's, that's impossible. You can't make a million dollars a year. Win the lottery. I'm like, no, no, no. Do you think it's possible to make two grand a week? Well, maybe, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, it's possible, right? If you owned a bit, if you're an employee, can you make two grand a week? Are there people Without that make, question, yes. right? So if you owned a business, is it theoretically possible if you could pay someone two grand a week, could you earn two grand a week as an owner? The answer is yes. Great. Do that one time. You learn how to make two grand a week. Now do it nine more times. Cookie cutter process, rinse, wash, repeat. Now you make 20 grand a week is a million 40 a year. Mm -hmm. All you did was figure out how to make two grand a week one time and then repeat the process. Yeah, that's like, uh, I saw a seminar with Bob Proctor who talked about that. Yeah. And he was like, that's, he started with uh, janitorial services. Yeah. Uh, custodial it's, uh, services. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like, but, but the first two grand a week is, I would argue, is harder to make than 10,000 a week. Yes. It, it's, I think, it's, yes. Learning yes. your process. To, yeah, man. Well, I worked for free at our acting studio for two years. There you go. I didn't I, make any money because I, I could uh, barely pay the rent. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. I worked and for free. And then it just flipped all of a sudden. I, actually, I don't want to be paid. I don't want to exchange dollars for hours. That's a problem. Right. Yeah. People are brainwashed. They, now, that's fine. That's I'm like rich cool. dad, poor dad. Yeah, <laughs> man. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Kiyosaki. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, I, 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 I don't want to get paid. I want to rev share. I want to get paid off of profit. Mm -hmm. Right. If I generate enough value that this ship <laughs> stays afloat, then I want to get rewarded. Yeah. But the problem is for for supposed safety, people sacrifice um, the reward. Mm -hmm. They say, you know what? I'm unwilling to take that risk. And here's the reasons why. And I'm much happier being in the box that I've been placed in by my mm -hmm. family and or mm -hmm. society. And that's okay, but how do you break people out of that? And there's a lot of friction, but well, once, sometimes you can't. You just can't, yeah. Because say, sometimes they, they all have to make that. It's the ideological thing right? we talked earlier about. Some people they have these foundations and they can't break yeah. them, and it's okay because it, it keeps them grounded. Yeah. And some people need that. And, yeah. and actually, now I've figured out I shouldn't. Again, this comes back to should I try to change everybody? No. No. Yeah. But the ones that want mm -hmm. to come down this path, the ones that want to be awesome yeah. actors. You can take them through the process if they really want it, right? If they yeah. want it bad enough, right? Sure. If you, I can, I firmly believe I can help anyone become a millionaire. Like, I really believe that. That number seems so small to me. Mm. Now, does that mean it takes three years or five years or 10 years? Well, there's a lot of factors beyond my control to, to dictate that. But again, we can just get back to the math of it. Yeah. What is that person willing to sacrifice to get there? How long are they willing to delay gratification? Another thing, too, is I think entrepreneurs are naturally flexible people like we're flexibly minded so oh, like yeah if you and we'll i work on a new project in a heartbeat yeah, yeah. we'll just do it like yeah. oh this is going to take six months we have to go somewhere we have to maybe live somewhere part-time we'll just do it yeah or if, if you yeah. work on a, a film like if you had to go move to la for two months to work on a sure. film you just it. do it you wouldn't think about it no and i wouldn't think if my wife wanted to do it and had to <laughs> my wife got a gig where she had to go to philly for like three months yeah. And we were like, this is how it is. We yeah. just figured cool, it out. Man. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I miss, it was, miss my wife and daughter. We 100%. Yeah, and every I 100 missed opportunity her, but I, didn't I can even see him, I would see I was him, like, know. this is just how our jobs are. Exactly. Yeah. And when I had to go to L.A. Um, last year for a month, my wife was like, yeah, cool. I'll drive you to the airport. Yeah. That was like a really cool, <laughs> was a really cool thing. I haven't had relationships like that. So I, I love the fact that my yeah. wife is... I mean, she understands acting, so she's right, kind of yeah. like, yeah, that's cool. You got to go where, go where you go. Yeah. Well, or if we had to move for some reason, we just well, move. Well, yeah, if you're unwilling to sacrifice for the opportunity, so it means if you're not willing to leave, 
then you shouldn't be doing that. You should go do something else that yeah. doesn't require you to leave. And there are people like that. Yeah. yeah. All- oh, I remember Kelsey and I were, we were like, all right, well, if we're going to expand, um, we need to make sure we have some backup money and we're going to chant some things, you know. So we <laughs> left our house and moved into the apartment up here because we were like, we got to, well, if that's what's going to help us make more long, like we didn't have those problems. Yeah, yeah. That might not be the kind of sacrifice you're talking about. No, that's about. definitely no, part of totally. it. But we that's, were yeah, like, 100%. okay, let's figure out how we can reduce our personal home expenses. 100%. So we can actually so can get more here. And then it turns into, that's right. you know, let's say 5000 a year. But if we can make an extra 50 there you go. K, yeah. that, was a, that was not a wasted year for us. Right? Exactly, that's and exactly we had a cool it. pool yeah. at the apartment. That's, <laughs> delay, that's <laughs> delayed gratification. That's it. Yeah. That's it. That yeah. is exactly what we I'm talking cool. about. We were cool. We were like, this 100%. year we can't get a Christmas tree, Yeah, but that's okay. Like, and I'm not saying that like from a martyr point of view, but we were just like, this is what we're willing to do for the greater good yeah. of expansion so well, you have to make sacrifices yeah. to be successful yeah at whatever you do yeah unless yeah. you just and i hate to even give that example you know because let's say you inherited a lot of wealth sure if you are unwilling to make sacrifices and learn and put yourself in, you won't keep it <laughs> right facts period i don't care how much money you inherit you will not keep it yeah right yeah. because you may you or it get won't a, last past your lifetime it won't because yeah. a man yeah, you won't uh, have anything to then hand down right yeah, yeah. a yeah. wise man meets a man with money Right, the man with wisdom ends up with the money, and the man that lost the money ends up with a little bit of wisdom. Right. Mm. So wait, I'm recording that in my yeah. head right now. <laughs> yeah. So I love these things. All right. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, but if you think about it, that's what happens. That's yeah. a process. Yeah. So one generation makes the wealth. They did a poor job explaining to the next generation about how to keep it because one generating wealth is one thing, maintaining wealth is a totally different thing. Right. Oh, man. So then that person has to learn very expensive lessons. They're not learning $500 lessons or $10,000 lessons. They're learning multi-million dollar lessons. And unfortunately, some of those things are hard to correct in a generation, right? So this is where you have, oh, yeah, you yeah, have yeah. somebody gets wildly wealthy, their children lose it all, and then the third generation typically starts to try to rebuild. This is this rags to riches to rags mm-hmm. deal. Okay. You know, so I would much rather learn very inexpensive lessons early on and I try to get my children to learn very inexpensive lessons and try to teach them those things so that they can become good stewards of what yeah. eventually they will inherit, right? Yeah, we yeah. learned very expensive lessons, though. Yeah, we did, man. <laughs> I, I learned some tough ones, buddy. I learned some multi-million dollar ones big time. Oh, but yeah. uh, Powerful. Me too. Yeah. I love that. So I don't know, man. It's a, that's what it is, but it's delayed gratification. It's sacrifice. It's, you know, and then you set yourself up to fail. So if I'm talking, let's say that I'm talking to someone that's that's telling me, they want to be a business person. Okay. And then I, I just keep asking questions. And really what it means is I want to be rich. I don't have to work. This is what they say. I don't have to work. I want to be. <laughs> and I'm like, well, wait a That's second. That's the actor that wants to be famous. Yeah. yeah I got you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, well, what do you mean you don't have to work? And they're like, well, if once I make this much money, I can just like relax at the beat. I'm like, well, listen, man, I got to, I got I to, gotta, I make more than that and I work more than ever. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right. Like you're not going to get there if your goal is to have a beach house and lay on the beach. You're going to get to the point where you own a beach house and you're going to relax on the beach. You're not going to get to this point because you can't delay gratification long enough. Yeah. Right? And, and it's okay. But so now I'm starting to set an expectation yeah. with someone. You bring someone into your, um, your acting community, right, and your school. Yeah. You guys are figuring out what their goal is, and you're setting the expectation that they have to, to do. And, and then you have to figure out if you're going to work together, right? And that's kind of the same thing. Yeah. It's, well, you're right. I mean, I have to ask somebody, why do you want yeah. to act? Why, what, what's making you be here? I mean, And they haven't thought about it, I'm sure. But not all of them have. They no, haven't really they, asked themselves that question. There's only like several. You probably get the same three answers all the time. I'm yeah. sure there's a, you know, a series of, oh, this one. I want this. I want financial yeah. freedom. Okay, cool. You uh, know, um, and most people are like, no, you know, it, it all comes down to yeah. you either love st- storytelling yeah. You love being on a team or you're looking for some form of financial or, or social gratification relatively quickly and acting promises. Right. A very small percentage can achieve that. A yeah. very, it's a lottery style system. Right. Yeah. Very it, small. Percentage. In business, I think it's the same way because, but it comes, how many people that go through the process mm-hmm. that fully ingrain themselves in that process, those people I would bet that you would say would statistically have a much greater chance of being successful than the ones that don't buy into the process and aren't willing to sacrifice. A hundred percent. And also the people that have gone through the process 
now they have a greater appreciation, they have a greater stamina, they, right. they have a different support team, they understand, all right. They, well, they've also heard other people's stories that have done the process. And so they know there's a, a different level of community yeah. um, that you can draw support from. And, and that's a wonderful, beautiful thing. Yeah. I, one of the common answers I get is they don't use this word, but they will say something along the lines of, I don't want to be, I don't want someone else to be able to dictate what I do. I don't want a boss telling me I have to do something. What I'm hearing is they have a problem with accountability. Mm. And I say to them, crap, that's what I say. Yeah. <laughs> then uh. really though, as a business partner or a business owner, right? As an entrepreneur, you are just accountable to someone different. You're not accountable to a boss. You're accountable to a partner. You're accountable to an investor. You're accountable to your customer. Sure. Right? Yeah. You are accountable. Like I'm accountable to the owner of our sure. facility, although I manage it all. Yeah. You're also accountable to your students. Yeah, and their parents. And their parents, right? <laughs> so, like, what I try to help them understand is, is that there's some level of accountability that it doesn't matter what role you play, there's a level of accountability. So, like, I'm trying to help them what took me a long time to figure out. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to have them have this type of conversation and just trying to ask them questions that they haven't asked themselves. They didn't know to ask themselves and get them thinking like, well, wait a second. Well, okay. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Right. Like I'll give me an example. I feel a duty. Loyalty works both ways. The last three months, obviously I lost hundreds of thousands of dollars personally maintaining my staff, my people, they didn't miss a beat, you know, trying to, right. Exactly. Yeah. I tried to do the best I could. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, that is some level of accountability. Like I almost feel like I owe that to them because again, I expect the world. I do. Yeah. But you can't expect the world. And then at the first sign of a problem, pull the rug out from underneath the people that are loyal to you. Yeah. Right. So, so it's got to work both ways, but I try to get people and I try to I try to get you off my team really, 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 really quickly. I want you to fire yourself before I put too much time and energy into you. Because mm. I can only do this. I think, okay, I like that's unique. I like yeah. that. So, I mean, if you're going to... Because that's what I really want. You know, I was talking about the litmus test that I create for actors. I'm hoping that they will, they will come to the conclusion this is not what they want to do right. within the first six weeks. Yeah, man. Save us. You only have so many hours in a day. Sure. So this, this is the point I'm at. I, I only have so much time. Yeah. And my time is valuable, not just because I make a lot of money, but because I've figured out that time is, yeah. is, um, finite. Okay. I only have so much time. I want to make sure that I'm not wasting it on this person. Mm -hmm. And, and the faster I figure that out, the better. And it's not nothing. Yeah. It's not a negative thing for me. We can sometimes people, so you talk about people, they think their chance of success is low, but what time period are we looking across? Are we looking across a decade or five decades? How many actors have gotten their, their role and they were 50 years old or 70 years old and they just hit, yes. you know, finally? Well, that's the, that's the great outlier of all of this is everybody, everybody tries to make it in their first two to three years. But it almost, now this is not a factual, factually backed statement, but I would say what we've started to notice statistically is the people that are working the beat longer than five years are less likely to quit. Everybody typically quits. Like the LA revolving door is two years. I tried it, I didn't make my millions, I'm out. Yep. I tried it, I didn't make my millions. Yep. But the people that have stayed longer than five years typically start to experience yeah. a very different pay scale. And then the people that are there 10 to 12 years have because now they've established you have to keep staying in it you know what i'm trying to say oh 100 and and it's like oh man you've been in it for this long yeah it would make sense you know who these people doing the man. hiring and all that the hiring and firing are that's right and uh, but everybody quits not everybody a majority of people quit within the first two to three years and i can't i can't really figure anything i, I it's still so early yeah. three years sounds like a long time but not as a self-employed no. independent contractor. I can't quite tell whether you got lucky or it was just the right time. Do you have long-term right. technique? Um, where you, because for some of our actors, they get booked based on a look. Yeah. 
Uh, and once that look changes or fades or they cut their hair or they get another role that doesn't do well, uh, you know, so it's like for us, we got to, you got to do five to 10 years for us yeah. to figure out what, whether you had it. Well, and I think, so for me, I agree with all that, what you just said. I, I think for me, it's like, I kind of try to come back to that original goal. They have these uh, awesome dreams, right? These awesome goals. Mm -hmm. And you didn't, you didn't conquer the world in two years. So you quit, right? Mm-hmm. We don't have a firm standing in reality in my book, right? Yeah. If you were going to quit in two years, I'd rather you quit in six weeks because it's not worth Same. it. Same. That's my formula. Yeah. Six weeks and you're out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, I want you to, so how, how do you get people that process and how do you get people to understand? So I always say this too, what, what pays you today may not pay you tomorrow. And, and the reason I say that yes. is, is the very first bit of success, someone that I partner with, someone that I'm helping, someone that I'm advising or consulting for the business, the very first bit of success they have. I try to, to let them enjoy it for a moment, and then I say, listen, I want to teach you something very valuable. What pays you today may not pay you tomorrow. Yeah. You need to take the revenue you're generating today and start planning for the day that this doesn't pay you anymore. Yes. And this yes. is this whole multiple streams of revenue, right? Some people call it RMR, recurring monthly revenue. We yeah. want to get I, – I need to get – laterally i need multiple things sure. generating revenue because if i lose one of them it can be it can be a devastation of my financial situation right right, right so right. when you far, start to get successful the very first thing you have to do is go what if i lose this i need to work on something else wow. right and as an actor i would say so if you had landed one show or one you know whatever it was that was paying you great you need to start one you either need to see that through as far as you can and or secondly you have to start looking for this other thing because this may not be Shows get canceled. Yeah. The best shows in the world eventually get canceled, right? There's, I mean, the average cancellation is like one, one or two years now because, yeah. because no one has to watch it if they don't want to now with, with uh, yeah. social uh, or streaming services. And there's so many different shows. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like, it was like 75 new projects that came out on Netflix around the world last month. Or, you know, so, yeah. And you're like, so they only get one shot to be good. That's right. And if nobody watches it, they're canned in a heartbeat. Yeah. Was it you that told me that someone, an actor told me, I think last year, that they were recording like 130 different series in Atlanta? I don't know if it's that many, but I know there was a ton. It was, I yeah, mean, that someone, was a, an incredible amount. It's a lot. Amount. Yeah. Yes. And it's not, and there's not like a season anymore. It's just, it's constant. Yeah. yeah constant well, production. I'm, you know. I'm always baffled when people are like, what are you doing for pilot season? It doesn't like, exist anymore. I was like, <laughs> what, what 1990s teacher are you training? For? <laughs> <laughs> because there is no, it's September uh, 1st, so all the fall shows on NBC are coming out. If a show isn't working, they're cutting it, like now. I, mean, I guess yeah. there's still a pilot season for I mean, network yes, TV. My manager talks about it, but he, he flat out told me, he was like, there's no need to come to L.A. Like, what are you going to do? Everybody's going to come here. Most people don't watch those shows out, anymore. Yeah. It'll be watered down. So, I wish, I wish I could see the... I'd like to see the percentage of people that watch network TV as opposed to, like, Netflix and Amazon. And It's, it's probably less. I haven't had it in 10 years. We don't even have cable anymore. <laughs> yeah, I haven't had it in 10 years. I'm an actor, <laughs> yeah. and I don't have cable. We just have... Yeah. I internet. have it, but just because of the internet... Sure. I, don't, I don't watch it. Like our family, we don't well, watch it. I love it. sports when they were on. Our nanny watches it. <laughs> That's why we have it. Like gotcha. the nanny watches cable. Okay. We all watch, we use the Apple TV so, yeah, or our yeah. phones. I'll stream stuff off my phone to the TV all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> just, yeah. Why not? Yeah. Why not? And it didn't cost any extra to have the cable, so I just have it, you know. But yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we don't watch it. We use yeah. we use the. Yeah, internet. we were just like we just care about the highest internet package to you have, 100%. so we can have really fast streaming for all yeah. of these things. That is it. We don't want people dictating what I watch <laughs> <laughs> when I watch it. Gosh, that was a big question for for the uh, for the union trying to figure out like, do we get paid residuals? If you were asleep and all of a sudden Netflix started showing the next episode and that actor was on, but you didn't really watch it and it cut off halfway through but never got to your scene, do you still get the residual paycheck for your face being on the episode if it never got to... So, so, that They're trying to figure out all these oh, yeah. contracts now. You know what I mean? Like, did someone choose to watch the show? Did it really get there? Yes, pay me. You're making plenty of money. Pay me. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, another thing that um, I've mentioned this before, I think what we'll see over the next decade is, because um, I think a lot of 
entertainment media will be free. I mean, it already is, but I think it'll really be free in maybe a decade. <clears throat> it'll have to be subsidized somehow, I think, through advertising and stuff. But I think we'll start seeing CGI used for ads. Like, like you'll sure. see, like you have a series, and if you watch the series this year, you may see like a Coca-Cola product in, that, in certain scenes. But then Pepsi buys that ad space, and mm. the next year when you watch the series, it's a Pepsi. Oh, so you'll start seeing products yeah. you know, interchanging in the, in the scenes through CGI. So I, I, I think that'll probably be a thing. And that'll, that'll probably subsidize all the media. It's like 10 years ago, they scared us saying that all commercials are, they were interested, they had gotten so good with, um, I guess, CGI. Product but, placement? Or? Well, CGI, like like if you were in the next Star Wars, oh, they yeah, could yeah. use your face. You know? yeah. And so they were like, we can um, create, like, uh, you know, you have, uh, well, instead of Jared, we'll have a new Subway guy. But yeah. he'll be completely right. CGI and we will have just made him up and we don't have to pay. They're yeah. just yeah. about there now. And I think they, I remember them yeah. 10 years ago, they were talking about, be careful actors, that's what's going to happen. They're going to create computer, you know. That's what the general is. It'll just be some voiceover actor. Company. Yeah. Well, that's terrible, though. Right, yes. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Hey, that makes me not want to get that insurance. That's why we got to have another uh, plan. The that's thing right. that made us money right now might not make us uh, that's exactly Have you it. seen the uh, Unreal 5 engine, the game engine? No. I don't have time to play games, but I like them. But, sure. But I'm just fascinated with the technology. And yeah. um, have you heard of the Unreal game engine? It's like what they made Quake and all that stuff with. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so <clears throat> it's a 3D game engine. Well, they've got Unreal 5 just came out. Did you see it? Yeah. Yeah. And it's unbelievable. It's photorealistic. Like Jeez. the, um, I guess the background stuff, like the yeah, the place that you're at in the game or the demo hmm. is, is photorealistic. Is it, you can't, do you do virtual reality with that? I think it will be, oh, okay. uh, but you can't. Everything is going to be virtual. Right? Yeah, but I, but you can't distinguish it for the background from reality. Now the person in the demo is, you know, not quite there, but, gotcha. but the, the background stuff and everything is unbelievable. And they, you know, they even use um, ZBrush. The artists use ZBrush on mm -hmm. some of the statues and and uh, 3D objects within the the game. Yeah. But you know, actually, everything in the world is. Is a three-dimensional object, though. So even like little pebbles and stuff. So it's guys. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So I mean, I could look at that and be Science like, oh, well, right in ten there. years, like it'll be completely indistinguishable from reality. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we got to come back to the other side too. You were just talking about is, what is the risk? So as a business person, mm -hmm. we've got a relationship. I feel like though actors. So let's say I own that HVAC company that you did the ad for, mm -hmm. right? You represent, I don't have a personal relationship with you. You represent a cost to me. And my hope is, is that I've analyzed this total cost of this commercial, which includes your expense, and I'm going to market it. And then I need to sell X number of HVAC related products or services right. to at minimum break even and then make a return. Yeah. If I can eliminate the cost of you as, as a, then I have to sell less units to break even, right? And my rate of return goes up, mm -hmm. right? So, do I think that people will do that if the technology is there? I think they definitely will. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. So, so is that a is that a real possibility? That's why everybody gets their kid to do the car commercial. Really yeah. though, you're still gonna have to pay him to do the voiceover work, and he gets paid the same. You but. can, or you go non-union, <laughs> and well, that's you, true. you yeah, get here. an employee. Like yeah. if you if you luck out, if you luck out, and your tennis club is gonna do a commercial, and all of a sudden one of your tennis pros likes to act. And they're like, wouldn't you think it'd be fun to do yeah, that? Yeah, man. Because that's, that's how car dealerships are getting their, um, they get their employees to do it. You yeah. can sign a, a little waiver. Yeah, those are not good commercials, though. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> now, some of them, have you seen the one with the, is it Spot, the dog with the red eye, with the, the, <gasps> Whoa, the, oh. the it's like a like the terrier. Dog. It's like a pit bull terrier. Bull, bull terrier. But there's, a, there's one that has a, a, um, a man and a woman in it and a dog. And I can't remember. They're really popular in like the Charlotte area. But they're actors from Florida. They don't know. Everybody thinks they own the dealership. They don't. Uh -huh. They're actors from Florida, and that's their dog. And <laughs> how about that? But other than that, I think you're right. I think they end up doing. They just get, you know, people in their circle to do it. And yeah, you know, well, and you can get a pretty inexperienced. Well, I wouldn't say an inexperienced. You can get a novice. And by novice, I mean a two to three year start. First two to three year starting yeah. actor 
to do one of those spots. I've done and some you, of those. Yeah, yeah, same. I mean, we all had to get started. Yeah. We had to pay our bills, right? So yeah. you would do a spot for five hundred dollars, seven fifty for the day, nine hundred for the day, and that's like huge money. Yeah. If you're if you were also working as a bartender, just trying to make it, you know, on a Tuesday, yeah. it's like nine hundred dollars. You want to do this thing? Well, sure. That's easy to sell a HVAC. Yeah. If you if your cost was only nine hundred. Oh, I'd, I'd do it all day long. And by doing it non-union, you don't have to ever. You can. It's one you, time. Yes, yeah, one time yeah. for nine hundred dollars, and you can say, and we own your image for three years. Do you yeah, it's need, a buyout. Yeah, yeah, it's a total buyout. Yeah. And um, and then what you also do is you you get them for the day. And you try to shoot three different versions of that same commercial spot right. with just a slightly different ending. Yeah. Your cost was still, you can see, I like that. Day. And this is the other side of negotiating yeah. the value of the actor. Like, so I'm going to say, hey, I'm looking at you as a number, and you're going to hopefully come at me and say, well, yeah, that's true, but let me tell you the benefit of doing this, this, and this, and this. Yeah. Right. So then this is an argument for why I might continue to pay for that service for a longer period of time. I have yeah. to perceive value out of it, right? Difference with that though is yeah. is with these types of deals, it's you'd, you'd be dealing with a production company, so probably a cable company or some TV station. It, this is cheap production. Yeah, if yeah, it was a good quality ad- production, it would be a lot more expensive. As I say, if you buy advertising time and you say I'm going to yeah. air this 30 second spot for 50 times this week, you buy 50 30 second spots on your local yeah. channel, right, or whatever. Yep. And I think if you buy a cert- somebody was telling me, I don't know if this is factually correct, you might have to fact check me on this. Twitter, uh, it, like, but if you um, if you buy a certain number of spots, then um, they send you their news camera crew to shoot it for free at no charge. Yeah, that's why some of them are so bad. Yeah, because they're like, oh, now I don't have to hire a production company. Yeah, yeah. That's and a- so we'll get we'll get Johnny on the spot who's in sales, and we'll get the news crew from the local affiliate and. That's how we're gonna have this commercial. That's, that's horrible. Yeah. So just in our small two-hour interaction here, you you think I got what it takes? Yes. <laughs> you have a story. Hey, I, you're that's a person. Somebody I'm needs a, to I'm hear. I'm an individual. Yeah. I like it. I got I, lots of stories. Absolutely. <laughs> Every acting professor is like, you shut up. <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem. Is you're telling everyone they can make it. I didn't say everybody can make it, but I think. See, I disagree. I think everyone can we're make can, it if they can. will do everything. Well, yeah, there has to be some. There, there is some other factors. Yeah. <laughs> Every, everybody, you know, you throw. If, if what all does make us, it mean? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. Some people think I've made it. Some people are still waiting for me to make it. Um, you know, I don't know. I guess now that's a whole new. Discussion. I think when you've made it, you know you've made it. Yeah. You yeah. Remember, I, I think uh, you feel. I, I think you reach a point in your career. And I haven't, in acting, definitely haven't made it. Not even close. I'm just getting started. But I don't know why I th- I'm laughing. I I'm think laughing. when people make it, they actually know they've made it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, yeah. I think if you, well, it's kind of like that in business. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you like to see homos naked. What? <laughs> I'm going to say I, I wasn't privy to that Hold earlier. on, you ready? Yeah. Home is what you make it. Now, do you know what movie that's from? Home is what you You'd make like, it. So I think it was Adam Sandler, and the guy was trying to say he's he was trying to say something about maybe Waterboy. I don't remember, but the guy couldn't speak. He was speaking like this uh, Louisiana jargon. Oh, oh Waterboy, yeah. 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 And he's like, and Adam Sandler said, "You like to see homos naked?" And he's like, "No, home is what you make it." So when you've made it, it you know what is make it? Well, home is what you make it. Like, yeah, uh. it's it's in your own head. That's why I'm over here chuckling my ass off. I'm like. <laughs> You like to see almost naked. <laughs> well, that too. <laughs> sure. I don't know. Hey. Anyway, I was way out of the field. I respect the human body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've been watching a lot of Chaz stuff lately, so, you know, they've been running naked. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, this yeah. is awesome. Thank you so much yeah, for letting yeah, me be sure. a part of your uh, family today, man. I it love was, this. I love fellowshipping. Definitely. It was, it was definitely, uh, awesome. it was definitely a, an experience. I enjoyed it too. Awesome. Do you want to uh, tell everyone how they can look you up and – Check me out on, on Insta, hey. Drew L. Matthews. And uh, I mean, I have Facebook, but I don't really use use it that much. I have all the accounts kind of connected now. There you go. But right, I love yeah. Instagram, and, and uh, I put out some funny funny content. And uh, that's pretty much it. Awesome. Make sure you look up uh, Drew Matthews on IMDb also. Oh, yeah, sure. Definitely. You're yeah. going to see some, some things I've done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of stuff. Yeah. Awesome. I love it. Well, thank you, guys, so much. And yeah, Jesse. 
Thank you, man. <laughs> You're over there. Man. So great no seeing problem. you again, buddy. Good seeing you, too. Awesome. And if you guys enjoyed the episode, be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next week. Bye.